Welcome to our new module called Classes. In this particular module, we are going to start the object-oriented principles implementation in the TypeScript. So initially, we'll see what exactly the classes mean, a quick theory out of it, so that the people who are very much new to the programming can understand what are the classes. So in the initial first few lectures, you can understand that. And then later, we'll also try implementing few of the examples where we are going to exercise how to create the classes and the objects out of it. Then we'll also see the constructors in detail, the parameters, access modifiers like private, public, protected. Then we'll also see the overriding, overloading, abstract classes, getters, setters, static properties, static methods, and many more exercises we're going to see in this module. So let's quickly start our new module classes. What is classes? So, uh, Classes is just a combination of properties and the methods. Generally, this definition we might have heard, but let's see, just understand this with a quick examples and I'll assure you in the next two minutes, you will quickly understand what exactly the class mean. So let's consider a bank account. So the, uh, the bank is planning to create a bank account and uh, a structure of the bank account. And then later, once they decided how the bank account should work, a bank account should have a number, a bank account should have a name, then a bank account should also have some balance and we should also give some facility called debit and credit for that particular bank account. So initially the bank officials just deciding how to create this particular structure, how to create this skeleton, how should be an ideal bank account should be. So they are just creating a structure, they are not creating any physical bank account, they are not going to create any bank account for their customers. They are just deciding on paper how the bank account should be a skeleton. So they have decided they are going to create a bank account class. We should have a bank account number. Then it should have an account name uh, from which person it belongs. It should also have some balance. Then it should have two facilities called debit and the credit. So bank account here is a class. It consists of three properties in it. A bank account is having an account number account name and the account balance and this particular bank account class is going to have two functions debit and credit let's understand from a real-time perspective so the bank official decided to create a bank account and any bank account in their bank will be is going to have three properties it will have a number name and the balance and in every bank account they want to give a debit facility and a credit facility. So this is what the bank decided, a skeleton created. Now all the people, all the customers who are coming to their bank and saying that I want to create a bank account with your bank. Now they will start creating the objects out of it. Let's say the first customer came and want to create the first account, account one. So immediately the bank officials will create an object out of this particular particular bank account and while creating this object they have to pass what is the account number what is an account name what should be the account balance initially and they have given two facilities for account one that is the debit and the credit again the second customer is coming and he's saying that i also want to create a bank account with your bank so the structure is already ready so immediately the bank officials are creating the second account here a second object and again adding account number to that, the name of the person, the balance initially in that particular bank account and given two facilities called debit and credit. And the same is happening for all further accounts which are getting created. So what is class here? The yellow dot here that you are able to see, that's our class. So it's a one-time process that we are deciding how the bank account should be, what are the properties will be in that and what are the methods will be in that. And later we can create any number of objects out of it. So this is what I mean by class. So hope all the people who are new to the programming, new to the object-oriented principles, clearly understood what exactly the class is and what exactly the object is. Now, how to create this class, how to do the implementation for this class using TypeScript, that we'll see in the next lecture. Let's start creating a class inside our TypeScript file. Uh, so I'm using the same code and the script.ts file here to create these classes. And I'm going to create the class called bank account, this yellow dot that we discussed in the last lecture.
So the syntax is pretty much simple. Just you need to mention a class here, bank account. Make sure B is capital here. Bank account, opening and closing curly brackets here. And now here, I have mentioned bank account as a class. I need to give these three properties inside that. So let's do it. Account number. It's a type number. Then we should also have an account. We are getting some errors. We'll see what is that later. Let me just complete this. Not to worry on that part. And what's your account balance? It's of type number. So we have created three properties for our class. These. And we are remaining with the two functions called debit and the credit. So let's do that as well. So debit. And credit. So hope it's pretty much simple here. And let me just also do a console here. Uh, debit all the credit function called. So this is what we have created in the last lecture. So now what is this error we are getting here? Let's try to understand that. It is saying that you have created a class but there is no mechanism for this particular myth, uh, properties to be initialized. What they are trying to say, you have created the class, but you haven't provided any mechanism to give the account number, name, and the balance. So we must give some mechanism here, and that is something called as constructor. What I mean by constructor here, so when we are creating this particular account one, we are going to give information here, that is account number 101 account name Navi, account balance 1000 rupees. So these are the inputs we are giving to create this account one. So that time, at the time of creation of this object, the constructor is getting called. So we also need to define a constructor inside our class. So constructor, it is going to have a set of parameters. Let me give, use the exact same parameters here. It is going to receive a number. If you are not understanding the syntax, follow with me for some time. I'll give you more explanation on the same. Let's quickly apply the prettier again. That's it. Okay. So we have created a quick function here, a quick constructor here, which is accepting these three parameters and let me just assign it to the properties. I'll give you a quick explanation in a minute. Okay, fine. Now, just get read out of it. Just forgot this particular syntax, whatever we have run. If you are a bit confused, here is our class ready with three properties and two functionalities in this. So we have achieved what we have discussed in the last slide. That's perfect. I want to create the first object account one. My first customer is coming now and saying that I want to create an account with you. Of course, we'll help him. So let account one. Okay, so you want to create a new bank account with us. So new bank account, new bank account. So of course, if I want to create a new bank account here, I need to give some certain information. I want to, I need to give the account number, the name of the person and the balance to create this account. Let's do that. So I'm saying the account number should be 101 and the name of the person is this. And the initial balance is 1000 rupees. So this is what the information I'm giving here. Let's apply the preview. Super clear. Line number 27. What we are doing here, we are just creating an object of our class. The first customer, we are giving them a bank account. Okay. So while doing this, so we are just calling constructor here if you're just observing it. So we are giving the bank account number, the person name, and the 
initial bank balance. These parameters are going inside your constructor here and initializing these values. So if you clearly observe, it is just accepting these three parameters and it is assigning to your class members that set. And what is exactly this, this keyword and everything? This we'll discuss in detail in the upcoming lectures. So for now, you can just ignore that syntax. Let's try to create the second object. The second customer is also coming now and saying that I want to create a bank account with you. That's perfect. So let's do account two here. Second account. and the balance so we are ready with here the two bank accounts so as many as people are coming we can just keep giving them the new bank accounts because we have the structure ready here we have the skeleton ready with a class so we can create as many as of objects out of this so let's quickly try to console these objects as well so i want to see what exactly is happening inside this particular account one here so Okay, so this is my bank account, which is having a bank balance of 1000 rupees, the person name and account number is 101. Okay, for account number one, specifically, I want to see the person name. Okay, sorry. So it's dot account name. And if you clearly observing here, as soon as I'm putting a dot here, it is giving me the list of things available inside that bank account. So three properties are available inside that bank account and two functionalities are available, two methods are available. So I just want to see the account name for this particular bank account. So it should give me the name. That's perfect. So here is the way to create a class with TypeScript and to create an object and to start accessing few of its methods. So let's say now the bank account one, uh, the account one holder this account one holder wants to perform some debit operation on his account so what he need to do he need to call this debit functionality how we will do that of course the debit functionality we haven't written in detail how the debit will happen how the bank account balance will get reduced we are just calling that functionality and we should just see that the debit called so account one wants to call its debit functionality wants to perform some debit operation Okay, debit call we'll also make it more specific and make sure that the debit functionality is get called for the account one only so here specifically i would like to mention the account number this dot account number so that i can check for which particular bank account it is getting called both the debit and the credit functionality so for the bank account one it should happen here yes it's happening for the bank account one then let's say the account two, the bank account two person is saying that I want to credit some amount to my bank account. So I want to use the credit functionality. That's also perfect. So this time this function should get called here for the account two. So this is how we have seen how to access the properties inside an object and how to also access the functionalities. Now it's time to define these functionalities in more detail and it's a bank account, how we can keep it more safe, how we can keep the balance more safe. All those details are going to come up in the next lecture. So see you in the next lecture. Let's see how the class will look like after the compilation inside into our the JavaScript code. So this is what the class we have written in the TS file. And if I just open my JavaScript file here, so after the compilation, my class is looking something like this. So this is the ES5 version of the JavaScript. So in which the class's support is not there. So it is just creating some blocks and function and a much more complicated way, something called as prototype and more. We don't need to even go in much detail about this. This is just to understand how the conversion from the TypeScript to the JavaScript is happening and how the JavaScript will, will be more complicated when you try introducing more and more object oriented programming. Along with this, also if you, I see here, so we have written here something called as a let keyword. So we are using these two objects as a let declaration here. And if I open the same one inside my JavaScript, so I'm not able to see the let, it is just showing the var. So what could be the reason behind this? I'll just pause for a minute so that you can think on it and let's try to figure out some solution for that. 
Okay, what's an issue here? So if you just open this TS config and see the target for this compilation into the JavaScript is given for ES5 version of the JavaScript. So let's make it six here, ES6. Be very, very careful with this particular TS config file and make sure once you're done with your experiment, again, set it back to the original one. So let's target uh, the compilation should happen and the output JavaScript file should come in the ES6 version. And uh, after the saving here, immediately the JS file will be created. And if you open the JS file now, it is writing something called as use strict mode here. And it is also giving some direct class keyword constructor and good functions. And it's almost similar to what we have done with our TypeScript. So the ES6 version of the JavaScript supports the classes. That's the reason after conversion of this TypeScript into the JavaScript, it is also showing as a class because the the ES6 version of the JavaScript support the classes. It also support the let and constant keyword. That's the reason it is also showing us a let keyword here. And let's change it back to the ES5 and let's see the JavaScript file. So it's the previous one. So we don't need to be much worried on this. This is just an experiment and, and to understand how the conversion is happening in background. And uh, we are using the target ES5 here. And we don't need to be much worried about here. We are using the let keyword or everything. The, job, the TypeScript compiler will take care of all these things very well in background. Let's work on the constructor a little bit in more detail. So we are having a constructor here, which is helping us to create an object of class bank account. And these constructor we are calling whenever a new object of a bank account is needed. And we are passing a set of parameters to it and we are accept, expecting here and then we are assigning it to the properties. So here, uh, one of the user who is creating a new bank account, let's say the account three, the name is ID is 103, this is the name. And for this particular person, initially we are not giving any balance. So he just want to start with zero balance. So instead of mentioning zero here, so we, let's say we are not passing any parameter over here. So how, uh, so we are getting some error here. It is saying that expected th uh, three arguments, but we are just passing two. So what could be the solution here? What adjustment we need to do inside this constructor? And uh, just to give you a hint, we have already done something kind of uh, similar thing previously in the last module. So you should be getting what adjustment need to be done in this constructor function so that it can meet the requirement and this particular line number 29, the third bank account creation should happen with just two parameters. I'll just pause for a minute. You can think on it, try to implement a solution and give a try. Here we go. So the very first thing, our requirement is this particular constructor should able to accept three parameters as well as two parameters. So the last parameter should be optional. So we have seen something called an optional parameter previously. So why can't I mention here a question mark? So when I'm doing that here, a question mark, what it mean? So either uh, this particular parameter can have a number or an undefined and uh, Assigning an undefined to this particular property is not allowed because compulsory we should give some a value to it. So what we can do here, so we can mention if we are receiving the bank, so if we are receiving the account balance, so in that case, only assign this value. Otherwise, say, this dot account balance equals to zero. Super simple. So in this way, the third parameter we kept as an optional one. And now if you see here, the error gone now. So now we can call with three parameters as well as the two parameters. And when you're calling with the two parameter, so by default, it is considering it as a zero. And this we have achieved with a optional parameter. We can also do the same thing with the default parameter. So let me just say it equals to zero here instead of this optional parameter, I'm just giving as a default parameter. So in this case, case it will be more simple. We just need to make like this. So if you are giving a value, well and good, otherwise I'll consider zero. So here also you can see all these uh, constructors are getting called very perfectly.
A quick note uh, regarding uh, this keyword here that I have told you previously, we'll see in more detail in a separate lecture. So it's time to discuss about this keyword here. So what exactly this keyword is saying that if I just come back over uh, on this particular sl slide and if you can just see we are creating an object account one, account two, account three. So that this keyword is representing this entire object. When you are inside account two, that this keyword represent this account two object. When you are inside account three object and you are writing this keyword, it is representing the account three object. So wherever you are calling the, this keyword, it will represent that current object. So let's see here. So when I'm calling here, I'm saying I want to create account one. Let's understand here this particular blue circle. I want to create this account one. I mean this one. So when I'm giving the parameters 101 and the name and the balance here, so it is going to the constructor. It is saying this dot account number equal to the account number that I have given you. So in this particular account object, this particular account number should be 101. In the same object, the account name should be the one that I have passed you. In the same object, the account name should be that I passed you. So this keyword is representing the object in which it is present currently for the execution. So hope it's pretty clear how exactly this keyword is useful here and if I just remove this keyword here from here what what's happening here we are using the same constructor parameter here that is account number two times and we are just assigning to itself so that's the reason to make accessible this particular uh, property of uh, the object we must say it this dot account number Let's talk about the access modifiers. So what is this access modifiers here? So we have seen like uh, we are having a different object account one, account two, account three, and it consists uh, consist of certain properties and certain functions in that. So we are having these three properties and two methods into that. But when this particular account object is created, so how it is accessible, how this account number, account name, account balance, debit and credit, how it is accessible when we are outside of the object. That is all about access modifiers. What is the level of access is given for these properties and this function that is what the access modifier. So let's try to understand this with an example. So this is my first account one. That's perfectly fine. Let me just remove the unwanted things. So this is my account one. I'm also removing the other things here. So in this particular account one, I want to access. So I'm outside of my object right now. It's very important to understand. This is my object. And at this particular line number 29, I am outside of my object. And I'm saying object one, I want to know your account balance. And I'm just trying to console it. Okay, so what's the balance for account one here? Thousand rupees. Let's refresh the screen here. We are able to see. So now anyone who knows account one object can directly see the account balance of this particular user. Or he can see any details. He can just say account number for this particular account one. And let's see their account number. So it's not a correct way to do this. So this is not that much protected, right? There is no privacy in this particular uh, access modifier, which is by default available. So what are these objects we are creating and the data present inside that we want to give the certain level of access to it. So by default, all these properties and the functions which are available inside these objects are public. And that is what the access modifier says here. It's a public one. So there are three access modifiers, public, private, protected. We're going to see public and the private in this particular lecture. And we'll see the protected in the upcoming uh, lectures where we are going to learn the inheritance. So let's talk about this particular public here. So by default, I'm saying all the properties and the methods inside a class will be public. So it is equivalent to this one. So right now, 
this is what happening by the compiler even if we are not doing it so by default compiler saying okay uh, so this account number is public and the name is public the balance is public so anyone who ha who is who knows account one can just say account one dot account balancer anything and they even can change the account balance here so if anyone having access to the account one so he will directly say account balance equals to let's say 300 and let's see the updated balance now so there is no data privacy in this particular object so to keep it more secure and if you don't want to allow this to be accessed outside of your object so you can keep it as a private so let's remove this particular public and replace with private for the account balance so as soon as i'm doing this if you just scroll down here and try to understand at line number 29 if i'm trying to access what's an account balance for account one it says that it's a private property it is not accessible outside of the object very perfect yes so how to access this particular account balance now so it is only accessible inside this particular class so if this particular class is providing any functionality like this is my balance then only you can see otherwise you can't so let's say i'm going to create one more functionality here one more function which is a public and i'm saying i'm saying show balance and here i'm going to console the balance is this dot account balance so now this particular account one is having a public method is giving a public method to see its balance of course this is also not that much convenient but what uh, what we have achieved here we are just protecting this particular account balance with the private modifier for now and if if i want to see now the balance so i can say log account one dot show balance let's see the outcome yes we are able to see and we can't modify this particular account balance directly so here is the way we have seen how the public works and how the private modifier works in the upcoming session we'll also see the other more details with the classes there may be a need for a certain field a certain property inside a class to make it as a read only let's see how to do that let's see in this example here there is an account number so whenever we are creating an account object here bank account object so what is the account number we are giving it initially so later it should not be changed ideally so this is a new regulation that bank is putting once you are using a bank account number for example uh, while creation then you can't change it later right now if i just go here and say account number dot account one dot account number i can just change it to whatever i need so this is right now changeable if we don't want to change it and the bank is applying new regulations here so bank will just change the class definition here and they will apply a read only modifier here so what is going to happen here this particular account number will be read only and it will just initialize once in the constructor so if i come here on the line number 32 it is saying that the account number is a read only property and you can't change it after the initialization so this is how the read only property works let's try to work on the credit method the credit uh, function in our class in more detail so we are having a method called here something called credit so we are also having a balance which is a private and now if i want to credit some amount to this particular bank account so the bank account class is giving me giving me a dedicated method to do that because whenever any credit will happen so there will be some certain procedures will be handled and there will be validation what is the amount you're crediting that must be with minimum this amount or it should not be a negative so all those things we need to handle and that's the reason there is a separate functionality called credit that the bank is giving us so let's try to work on this credit method so i just uh, see here show balance first of all to understand what is my balance so the balance is 
right now the thousand and why it is showing undefined here any guesses i'm getting undefined on line number 33 here i'll just give you a minute to think on it yes we are calling show balance here and we are not returning anything here so no need to mention inside a console log let's confirm perfect so now i want to call count one dot credit so i want to credit some amount over here so right now this credit function is not expecting uh, accepting any particular input value so we'll say amount it's of type number and here this dot my account balance should be plus equals to or to be more specific my account balance should be added with this amount that's perfect and here i need to keep an input so let's say i want to increase 100 rupees here that's perfect and now i'll try to click i'll try to again call the show balance let's see yes so previously the balance was 1000 rupees then we were uh, calling to add the 100 rupees here and the updated balance is double one double zero why it is showing 101 here yes we are just showing here account balance right sorry account number let me remove that and let me also add log here doing credit of this amount let's see the outcome now so the balance is this then doing the credit of 100 and then balance is double one double zero that's perfect now here let's understand the magic of object oriented programming the people who are new to the object oriented programming and the scripting very first thing we are just creating an object that, and later we are just using the functionalities provided by the object so we are just saying okay i want to see the balance i want to do some credit i want to again see the balance it means every functionality that our bank is defined very well in this particular class we are just making use of these functionalities and like us thousands of other bank account holders will use this and this is what the magic of the object and the class is here that's perfect here but with this particular credit let's say the people trying to uh, uh, just add the zero rupees here which is of no use so bank again should put some validation on its logic of credit right so again the bank can improve its class and improve its method of the credit so what the bank will do here the bank will say if the amount is greater than zero then only this credit option should work else it should say invalid amount to credit that's perfect let's see the outcome now yes it's a thousand rupees and then we are giving a zero here to credit and then what this particular function is doing it's saying that it's an invalid amount to credit and the credit operation is not performing so with this what we are achieving we are achieving to add the balance to do the credit in very much well validation fashion the bank introduced a new validation here the bank also can put some more limitation sometimes you might have seen the bank will say no minimum this amount is necessary to do the credit let's say the bank is saying minimum uh, 10 rupees are necessary for the credit so okay if uh, i'll say uh, uh, greater than or equal to 10 then only this credit will happen otherwise not possible let's try to do here uh, let's try with the 9 rupees here it should not work invalid amount to credit and let make it 12 rupees then the credit should work that's perfect so this is how we are applying more and more validation to make our class more powerful and this particular bank account is working in a well fashion now now let's try to work on the debit functionality so in this debit functionality again the customer want to uh, debit some amount so again he will here we'll give some input called amount and here again we'll give the similar logic if the amount is greater than equals to 10 then we'll allow the debit process 
just make a copy out of it it will be super simple so doing the debit of then we should do a minus invalid amount to debit that's perfect so let's try to call it quickly here so instead of credit we'll do the debit now so initially we are having 1010 here and let's try to debit the 100 rupees now that's perfect okay let's try to combine together so debit and again i got some amount so i want to credit in my account i want to credit let's say 200 rupees so initially 1000 then i uh, debited 100 then the balance is 900 then again i'm crediting to 200 rupees the updated balance should be double one double zero if i again see check my balance that's perfect now on top of this also many more advanced validations you can put let's say for example uh you, you might have seen like the number of times you are checking a balance with your account or you are doing a certain operation the bank will give you some extra uh, put you some extra charges so let's try to work on those extra charges so let's say uh, i'm trying to use this debit functionality so if i'm using the debit functionality three, three times so the bank will not charge me anything but if i'm uh uh doing uh the debit more than three times the bank will start charging me the 10 rupees for example or the certain percentage of whatever the debit i am doing so initially we'll just we are not working on that count i'll just try to apply some extra charges on the debit so this is a new regulation put by the bank on our debit functionality so let's go to the debit functionality here so whenever the customer wants to debit something so whenever customers trying to debit something so along with this particular amount the bank is also started charging some extra amount so let me just put that extra amount over here inside a variable and say it like uh, debit charges okay and i'll make it uh, a direct one something like uh, five rupees here debit charges and here whenever the debit is happening from my balance what is the amount i am deducting along with that one more i want to debit that is these debit charges and here i should say this dot debit charges so let's see how it works now so a uh, thousand rupees balance then we are debiting the hundred rupees but the extra five rupees got deducted from my account due to the debit charges and in this particular debit process we can also display here like debit charges applied so that it, we can also see that very carefully here that's perfect so along with this 100 rupees extra 5 rupees charges are applied and your updated balance is 895 okay here we go so we have applied an extra charge and now there is a quick task to you i'll just take a pause for a minute and now you need to think on a logic that you should allow a debit for three times free of cost if the customer the same customer who is doing a debit more than three times then only you should start applying these debit charges so if initially i'm just making the first debit so it should not apply the these five when I'm doing it the fourth time, then this extra five rupees should be applied as a debit charges. So I'm just taking a pause for a minute so that you can think on this logic. You can pause the video and try to write the code. And anyway, I'll show you how to do that. Perfect. Hope you got the answer. So let's try to solve this problem here. So very first thing, what I'll do here, I'll create a variable here called uh, a, a property here and uh, I'll say number of debits. It's a number. Initially, the number of debits will be zero. Then, whenever any debit is happening, whenever any successful debit is happening, so whenever any successful debit is happening, it means here. What I'll do, I'll just increase this count whenever any successful debit is happening that's perfect and with this what i'm getting this is the 
uh, first debit, second debit, I'm getting that number of debits here, right? And uh, let me increase this here, I guess. That will be more correct because initially we kept it zero, right? So it will be the first debit, second debit, third debit, something like that. And let me just console also here uh, the debit hash. I just want to see what is what is the count of debit going on. Okay, so this is the first debit. Then we don't have any other debits. We'll do one thing. Uh, show balance. Okay, here also we'll do the debit again. And we'll make a constant same amount of debit so that it will be easy for the calculation as well. So total four times debit I'm calling here with 100, 100, 100. So let's see now. Yes, the debit charges of five is applied. Now the updated balance. This is the second debit, third debit, one, two, three. Total three debits we are doing here. I guess the four debit we are doing here, right? One, two, three, four. Okay, I missed saving the file. So total four debits are happening here. That's perfect. So now, uh, before applying these charges here, before applying these charges, so what we can do, I can write one more if statement here by stating that if the number of debits gone beyond three, if the number of debits gone beyond three, then you apply these debit charges and apply this particular deduction as per the debit charges. Otherwise, let's do it in a normal way and don't even print this console, debit charges are applied. So this is what the new regulation the bank is putting with their class and accordingly all the bank accounts will work now. Let's try to see. It's very interesting. We are having a balance of 1000 rupees. The first debit is happening of 100 rupees. The updated balance is 900. Second debit, 100 rupees, 800. Very interesting here to see the 5 rupees of deduction charges are not getting applied till the third transaction. Till the fourth transaction, sorry. So it's an 800. Again, the third debit, it's a 700. When the fourth debit is happening and here we are again deducting 100, there the 5 rupees got extra deducted. And let's at the end print the balance here. So at the end here, extra 5 rupees are getting deducted. And from now onwards, whatever the extra uh, uh, debits will happen on top of this, the extra charges will be applicable. Now let's see the bank uh, changing some its regulation and something and it's saying that, okay, so I was allowing you three free debits, right? So we can also make, they, they can also make it only two debits in upcoming days, maybe five. And they can also make it per month, per year, whatever it could be. So these extra logics putting over here, it's not a big deal. They just need to change this class behavior, this class functions behavior. And here is a power of the object oriented programming. These things will help you to simplify in a much better fashion. Let's try to discuss about the static property and what's the use out of it. So very first thing here, we require some functionality in such a way that we want to count the number of bank accounts got created in our bank. So we are having a class here that is bank account and we are creating the three different objects here for this particular bank account. And each and every customer is having their own details inside these objects. So now the problem over here is when we want to count the, there should be a count that a bank want to maintain, like how many bank accounts got created till now. So what they can do? So can they store that information inside this particular object here? No, because these objects are individual for that particular customer. Bank want to store the count of number of bank accounts created at some common place that bank can access. So of course, it cannot be done inside these objects. So a new way to store this information inside a class that is called as static property. So if you want to, so till now we haven't stored any data inside a class. We have just used this particular class to create a skeleton, to just create a structure, how the bank account should look like, what all the information it can contain, what all the functionality it can have. 
but we haven't stored any data in that. So it's time to store some data which is accessible by all the objects out of it. So that is the static property. So to do that, I will just introduce here a new property that is called count. So the count is a new static property inside a bank account class we are introducing. And now this belongs to the class. It doesn't belong to the objects. If you clearly observe the account number, account name and balance, these information we are storing in the account, in the object that is accessible through the object. But this particular red colored account, a static property is only accessible by using this bank account. So now all these objects can commonly use this particular account to just keep it increasing whenever the creation of the new object is happening. So let's try to do it practically how it works. So I'll just remove these <coughs> credit and debit to just keep it simple. And uh, I'm just collapsing these functionalities here because I don't want to keep the it complex for now. Okay. So here a new property called static property. I want to introduce this one count. So I'll say public. It's a public property. The name of that is count. The data type should be integer and the default value in it. I want to give zero because I want to start with a count of zero. That's perfect. So now here, let's say I want to see how many bank accounts currently we are having. So I just want to access this count variable, this static variable. So how I can access that? I'll say console bank account dot count. Bank account dot is the issue. I guess I have missed something here. Yeah, I missed adding a static keyword here, which is very important. Okay. So let me come back here and say bank account dot count. Okay, let me see the outcome. I'm getting it zero. So I'm able to access this particular account variable by using the bank account class and that you can see here. It's time to perform the calculation for this count. Now I'll just pause for one minute and I'll give you time so that you can write some code and what you need to do, you need to write some code here like whenever these bank accounts are getting created, these objects are getting created, you just need to increment this count variable by one. I'll also give you a hint. So you need to perform this action when your object is getting created. So you can just think on it and write some code and uh, we'll uh, I'll just take a pause for a minute uh, and we'll restart. Okay, here we go. So how we'll do this? So here we are having something called as constructor and we have already seen this constructor will get called every time you're creating a new object. So let's say I'm just doing a console here. I'm saying creating new object. I just want to do a console here. That's perfect. And I'm creating two different objects. Let's see the output. So I'm able to see these constructor is getting called every time, right? That we have already learned. And right now we are also confirming it. And one more thing, a good habit that I would like to introduce you people now Whenever you are trying to create any new logic or trying to implement a, a new functionality, just initially check the flow is working or not. I'm pretty much sure this constructor will get called for each and every new object creation, but still I'm just writing one console so that I can just cross check. Okay, fine. Everything is working fine so that I can start writing my next logic. It will help you to go step by step. Sometimes what happens, you will be keep writing the code by assuming, okay, fine. Your constructor will get called and, uh, you will be in constant uh, uh, in implementation of the upcoming logic, but maybe any core logic or maybe any core functionality is missing. So that's the reason. Keep it step by step. Check yourself to the console log at every step and keep checking and then go forward. It might look a bit, uh, a bit uh, uh, like a simple steps we are following, but it will help you to reduce the errors in the code that you are writing. Okay, so I got a place here where I can increment this count. So what I will do here, I'll just say bank account dot count. 
plus equals to 1 always whenever this construct is getting called. And just add a comment here as well incrementing count. Incrementing count here. That's perfect. And now let's try to see the count here. Yes, we are getting two. And again, I'll try to create one more bank account here with the third person. And again, I'll try to see the count. Let's see, it should be three now. Yes. So here is the way we are using this particular static property to utilize it from all our code and we are storing some extra information inside our bank account class. In the next lecture, we'll see the static method, how it will be useful and how it will be beneficial with some of the examples. Let's understand the static method. So we have seen till now the static property called count inside our bank account class. But uh, now there is a requirement like we should also have some common functionality. We should also have some common method which uh, should be called directly from a class level. It should not be called from our objects. So what could be that requirement? For example, we are using this count. So why can't we create a functionality, a static functionality inside our bank account class which will give us the number of count, the number of bank accounts created till now. now. So we are going to create a get count, a new static method inside our bank account. So previously we were accessing directly bank account dot count as a static property to understand what's the count going on right now. But we'll keep that private now and we'll use it by using a good method called uh, get count. So let's try to implement it quickly. So here we are using this particular public private uh, public count as a static and uh, we are able to see what's count going on. We have also seen the output for that. Uh, let me just make it more simple and tell you what problems we'll have if you are not using the static method. So it's giving us the count too. That's perfect. But what if I made it like this and then I'm trying to see the count. Will it will change this particular count? Let's see the outcome. Yes, it's changing. So it's not correct. This particular count should not be changed outside of this particular class. It should not be allowed to change in this way. It should be only allowed to change inside a constructor like this. So what we need to do at this particular place. I'll just take a pause for a minute so that you can think on it and find the solution. Okay, so what we can do, we can just make it a private. As soon as I make it private, the statement that I'm writing over here at line number 60, 59 is started giving error. Like we can't directly access the count variable. And this is what the data privacy and safety is necessary because this count should not be directly accessible in this way. So for that, we are going to create a new method here called public, a new static method and get count. And here we are going to return, sorry, we are going to return the count variable. And here this will say the bank account dot count. Super simple. And now here, whenever we want to console and see how many bank accounts created till now instead of using the count we can't use it now because it's a private one even you can see the error it's a private one we need to use this get count get count let's see the outcome that's perfect try to create the new one and then again try to console it I'm not changing these values over here because we just want to check the count. We should get the three now. Yes, it's working very perfectly. So now the count increment is happening only at the valid place and it is not allowed outside of the class. And this is a way this static method is helping us to get the count. And this static method we are calling by using a class. It is not by using an account. And let's also understand from the slide here. This is a get count method that we are using 
from bank account class. So hope it's clear how the static properties, how the static methods will be useful to create the practical applications. What is inheritance? So inheritance will try to learn with an example here. So basically the inheritance means if you if you are using two classes and one class is inheriting another class, so the properties, the methods, what is the behavior of the parent class is there that is being inherited to the child class. So we don't need to write the same behavior in the child class. Let's understand this with a quick example and a quick note to the people who are pretty much new to the programming. The concept of inheritance you can very well understand here with an example and we are also going to see a quick small uh, application with that with a bank account and then with a student bank account then a business bank account how this inheritance will work in this example let me just navigate here next so let's say we are having a simple bank account that we have previously cre created so the name of the class is bank account it is having three properties in that and two methods in that for its functionality this we have seen very well with some examples also uh, and this is our parent class. But now the bank is saying that we don't want to give directly the bank accounts to the customers. We want to give two different types of bank account. One is special to the uh, students and one is special to the business people. So the bank want to categorize their bank account on two different types. One is the student bank account. Second is the business bank account. But in both these bank accounts, the core functionality will remain same. Like let's say both will have the account number, both will have the name, both will have the balance, debit and credit facility. But just on top of this, they will just give some extra facilities to student bank account and they will give some extra facilities to the business bank account. So let's say the bank want to create or inherit this particular bank account in a child called student bank account. This is all bank is just deciding and creating a structure. They are just creating a class. They are not giving any bank account to any customer. This is just they are designing a behavior. They are creating the classes. Simply. Fine. So they are trying to create a child class here called student bank account. So when I'm saying child account, so it, they are performing an inheritance. So all the facilities which are present inside our parent bank account class, like account number, name and balance and these debit credit facility will already part of this student bank account because it's a parent here on top of this in student bank account they want to give few additional options what are those that is college name and the facility they want to give that is a student loan so one new property called college name they are introducing and a new method in the student bank account they are introducing that is student loan so here in the student bank account how many properties are there right now four Three are coming from the parent over here and the fourth one is the college name. In student bank account, how many methods are there? Three. Two are debit and credit coming from its parent class here and one specially given to the student's bank account that is student loan. In the similar way, bank also want to give a specialized uh, account to the business people and give some extra facilities. So again, they are inheriting the bank account class here and creating a new child class called business bank account. And in that, they are giving two different new options again, a new property called what's your business name and a new method called here business loan. They want to give a business loan facility also to the business bank accounts. So total four uh, properties are available here inside the business bank account. Three are coming from here. The fourth one is this. And total three methods are available inside the business bank account. Two are coming from here, the parent and the third one is business loan. So this is what the bank decided. They are going to have two different types of account and they have created the behavior for that. They have created the classes for that. Now they will start giving these bank accounts to the customers. Then the upcoming objects and everything will come into picture. But before doing that, we'll just try creating the classes and perform these inheritance before creating the objects. So hope it's pretty clear what exactly the inheritance means and how it works. So let's quickly understand with an example. So in the similar example that we have previously seen, I'm just going to delete everything here. 
because I want to start with a fresh. Of course, I'm going to create the same bank account, but to give you the more clarity, because in the previous example, we were having some static and all some more confusions. So that should not confuse you with the inheritance part. So let's quickly create the same thing. So this is our bank account. We are going to have the account name in it, account number. I'll also request you people to create the separate one instead of modifying the existing one because it might introduce you to some new errors if you are new to this area. That's perfect. After that, these are the three three methods are ready. What I need to do, I need to create a constructor. So the name, then bank account number, then account balance. Okay, and we know here already how to use this keyword and all. So I'm using the same. That's perfect. Let's create the two functionalities debit, just mentioning here like a debit called and in similar way the credit we don't want to much focus on the debit and credit functionality now because we need to understand the inheritance let's quickly apply the document formatter the prettier and here is my class ready the bank account class and this is what we have seen in the slide it's time to create our first child class with the inheritance called student bank account. Let's do that. So I'm just collapsing it so that it will look simple here. Class student bank account. Okay. So this is a class that's perfect in this particular class what should be there there should be a college name as a property there should be a student loan as a method let's do that so college name there should be a method called student loan perfect now here we are again getting some error here call college name is something is not initialized or something what could be the reason for this again understand this is a normal class till now we are not applying any inheritance so why we are getting this error i'll just pause for a minute so let's try to figure out the solution for this yes because we are missing a constructor here so let's quickly add a constructor the constructor i'll say college name it's of type string this dot college name equals to college name perfect we are ready with this particular class called student bank account which is holding one property and one method in that and this is what we uh, we have seen in the previous slide now only the part remaining is to put this particular inheritance now we need to make this bank account as a parent class and this particular student bank account as a child class so how to draw this particular attain uh, inheritance so you just need to mention here extends extends bank account so this particular exchange bank account is saying that all these three properties and the two methods will be the part of this particular student bank account now as soon as i'm doing this i'm started getting some errors at this particular constructor what could be this error you can just hover your cursor over here and just try to read these errors and just try to figure out what could be the reason. I'll just take a pause for a minute so that you can think on it. Yes. So now here, what this particular class is saying 
in this particular student bank account class it's a child class so whenever the constructor for this particular child account is created so not only the college name should be given we should also give the account number account name and the balance because in this particular student bank account only the college name is not only property it is also having other things these three properties in it and if you see we are just making use of college name so we should also make use of other properties here so let's copy these three properties from constructor copy and paste it here inside a constructor now observe here the four parameters of the constructor for the student bank account we are giving account name we are giving account number and the balance and the college name and here i am just using college name here for the assignment now what to do with this account name number and the balance how we can give it to initialize our account number name and the balance so for that we need to call a super constructor what is this super? This super is saying that you are going to call a constructor for your parent class to initialize these properties. That's perfect. And to initialize these properties inside my parent, I need to pass these three parameters which are already available with me. So let's quickly do that. Account name first, then account number and then account balance. Now all the errors are gone. Again, give a quick overview what's happening here inside this constructor. We are giving four parameters. Three are going to the parent one and one is using itself in the child one. So th this is how we have created the student bank account. Now it's time to you to create business bank account. And with this new property and the new uh, method in that, I'll just take a pause. You can pause this video and just try to create business bank account. Then later we'll do it together. Let's try to do it together now. Class, and I can just make a copy of this now. So, to make it more simple, and I'll just collapse it. Okay, so this is my parent, this is my child, and this is the new business bank account that I'm creating here. Business bank account that is extending from the bank account, it should have the business name in it. Then Instead of this college name, we should have the business name here. And here also we should have this business name and the business name. And instead of student loan, we should give a facility of business. Sorry, I missed the spelling for this loan at all the places, I guess. Sorry for that. So this is business loan and here also student loan for it. Okay, so what we have done now, we have created the business bank account class, a child class, and for which the parent is the bank account. So we are ready with all of the three classes. In the next lecture, we'll see how to create a particular object for our student bank account and how to create an object for a business bank account. Time to create the objects for the classes we have created so let's say now uh, the students are coming in they're saying that uh, we want to create uh, create our bank accounts as a student bank account in your banks so let's try creating the objects for them so very first thing whenever we are creating this particular object now in this particular student bank account object they must pass four information one is the account number then account name account balance and what's their college name and once they are doing that, they are getting the three facilities in their student bank account that is debit, credit and the student loan. So let's try to do it. So these are our three classes and now we are going to create an object for student bank account. So let student account one and they want to create a new student bank account and they need to pass how many parameters? Four. Account name, account number account balance and the college name so what's the name of the account they want to give what's the number they want to use for their bank account so i'm giving 101 what's the balance initial let's say thousand rupees and what's in college name here i'm giving abc 
that's perfect this is what we have created an object that is looking here in the slide now they can use a variety of functions they can use a debit facility they can use a credit facility they can use a student loan facility so let's try to quickly call that student account one they want to use the credit facility perfect they want to use the debit facility let's see in output yes they are able to use the debit and credit facility very important note here we are creating an object for student bank account and now you can see in this particular student bank account object they are calling debit and credit which is present inside the bank account because the student bank account is inheriting these facilities from the parent so inside a student bank account they can call debit credit as well as the student loan facility and they can also have a student loan facility so they can also call this function which is available directly inside the student loan uh we are not getting a console here i guess we missed adding some console okay let me do that so student loan call in the similar way we'll also add the same inside the business one maybe we missed there as well so this is business loan call very perfect let's see the outcome very perfect let's move and again one more student is coming and saying that i want to create one more new bank account with you a new student is coming let's try to create for him so they can copy the same one the second student bank account the name of the person will give their bank account number what the initial balance and what's their college name that's perfect so we are ready with the second student bank account now a new businessman is coming and stay saying that i want to create a business bank account in your bank so this one so let's create that let business account on again we need to pass the four parameters account name number balance and the business name so what's the account number they want of let's say 1001 and then the balance let's say 5000 here and the business name is pqr just a sample that's it so we are ready with the new object called business bank account object for our new business customer and this is the way we create the objects for all the classes we have created here as a child class. While creating an object, it doesn't matter you're creating an object for the parent class, you're creating for a child class. Once you are having ready with any class, it could be parent or the child, the method of creating the objects are similar. It is just that how internally it's working. So hope it's pretty clear how to create the objects for the student and the business accounts here. Let's understand the method overriding. So uh, what's the need of method overriding? First, we'll try to understand. There is something called a bank account here, which is our parent class here. And there is something called a business bank account here, which is our child class. So from my business bank account, can I do a debit? Yes, of course, do because that functionality I'm getting from my parent class and the business account people can also do a debit transaction on their account because this debit facility is available. So this debit facility is defined where it is defined globally inside my parent class. But the business bank account, the bank uh, came up with some new regulation. They are going to give a different debit operation. They are going to give a different debit behavior for especially for their business bank account holders. They want to modify the debit behavior, how the debit will happen from their bank account, especially for their business bank account. But in this case, they can't do because the debit functionality is coming commonly, which is defined from a bank account, which is their parent class. So how to do that? So in this case, the method overriding will help. Whatever the debit method is coming from the parent class, they can override inside the business bank account. And that is what called method overriding. So they can create one more method with the same name called debit and write the functionality in their own way, specially dedicated for business bank account. Let's try to do this with an example. So we have already this debit functionality here that we have seen in the slide. 
this debit functionality and now as the bank decided they are going to give a specialized debit functionality so they will create one more debit function with the same name which is coming from the parent here they are creating one more new one here and here let me just say uh, special or uh, updated debit function for business accounts that's perfect here and now from this particular business account if i'm calling the debit functionality let's see what happens so it is calling the updated debit functionality which we have written over here and now let's see if we are not having this debit functionality of course it will call the previous one so let's just comment once the debit function here and if you are trying to call the debit functionality on your business account on your business account here so what will happen it is going to call the parent one super clear so this is how uh, the method overriding works and it will help you to understand how the uh, uh, you can override a behavior of a particular function inside your child class in upcoming uh, lecture we'll also see try implementing one of the example how uh, a detailed modified functionality we can create and with an example something called like with business bank account uh, the debit functionality is allowed up to minus thousand rupees or in the normal bank account it is just allowed up to zero rupees if you are going below zero your debit will not be allowed but in the business bank account it will be allowed up to minus thousand rupees that functionality will build in the next lecture yeah so instead of just writing the dummy functionalities for the debit let's try to write actual debit operation inside our bank account here which will allow us to debit in a uh, amount where till the time our account balance gets zero and it will not allow when the account balance will go zero but in the business bank account we'll try updating uh, the same method overriding it and giving an updated functionality where the debit uh, operation will be allowed till the time your balance account gets up to minus uh, 1000 which is allowed on the business bank accounts so let's try to implement that so initially i'm implementing the normal debit functionality inside our parent class so yeah so we have just written zero uh just a log here and let me just write debit called and i'll say here parent class just so that when we are getting a console we should uh, also understand from where it is getting caught uh here i will give an input called what amount i want to debit and here i'll say if uh, what are the balance I'm having or we'll say let updated balance equals to what are the current balance is there in my account minus whatever the amount that the customer is asking so this will be my updated balance make sure we are not changing our actual account balance so if this updated balance goes below zero so we will not allow this debit transaction so we'll say not allowed to go below zero perfect and here if it is not going below zero then will perform the actual transaction account balance minus the amount one be very careful here we are not changing the actual account balance we are just seeing what will be remaining the balance after doing a transaction and here is what we are doing in actual and changing our actual balance here with by deducting the amount and here we'll say okay this is not needed and with, with, along with this I'll, one more i'll create like show balance a new functionality i'll create because periodically i'll be keep needing it to check my balance okay so let's comment out all uh, 
call up all the unwanted functionality so that it will look simple. So I'm ready with the debit functionality, which is capable of taking an input, which also allows only the debit when our account balance will remain more than zero. And this is what we have built the debit one. Let's try to call it. So here from my business account, I'm trying to call a debit functionality of I want to debit a hundred rupees. And before that, I want to also console. Okay, console is not necessary because in show balance itself, we are doing a console. And after our debit happens, let's also try to console again the show balance. We are having the 5,000 rupees in the ba business bank account. Then we are debiting the 100 rupees. Now we are remaining with 4,955. That's perfect. Now let's try to debit 5,000 rupees and then try to show the balance again. So after deducting the 100 rupees in our account, only the 4,900 rupees are remaining. But if you're trying to again deduct the 5,000 rupees, it will go minus 500, which is not allowed in our debit operation here. So let's see how it behaves. So initially the 500 got deducted successfully. Again, we are trying to deduct 5,000 rupees. It is saying it is not allowed and your updated balance is still remaining 4,900. And the 500 deduction got failed. It's saying not allowed. That's very perfect. But now a new requirement came that in the business bank account, the bank decided to give the facility so that people can also uh, uh, debit and uh, go in minus also up to 1000 rupees. So let's try to build a overriding function here in the business bank account for this. So I just copied this function from my main parent class and inside the business bank account, here I'm going to create the debit functionality as an overriding and also I'll mention here it's overriding. So again, we'll take the normal amount, what amount need to be called, uh, but debited and debit call from child class here. Then what will be my updated balance? And here instead of zero, I'll mention when it will go below minus thousand rupees, then only not allowed till the time you can allow it. That's perfect. Let's try to call the same functionality now. Okay, so we are detecting the 500 rupees here. So the balance is remaining 4,900. Again, we are detecting the 5,000 rupees and it is allowed here. Why? Because we are calling the debit updated overridden function, which is specially designed for our business bank account. And it is allowing up to minus 1,000 rupees. And here if you go, so it is saying that the updated balance is minus 100 rupees. So again, I'll try to do more debit transaction here with one more thousand rupees so or yeah one more thousand rupees if i do this now it should not allow me because my negative balance will go up to 1100 which is not allowed let's see in this case not allowed to be uh, to go below mm, here i need to modify not allowed to go to be negative minus thousand and you can see here it is not going below this particular limit that we have given. So here also there is some limit and uh, we are writing an overridden function which is giving a updated facility, updated behavior for this function inside this overridden function of our business account class. Let's cover up one remaining access modifier that is protected and it's a perfect time to introduce this access modifier in this particular situation. So the scenario is we are having an account balance here inside my bank account parent class and uh, we have already overridden the debit method which is coming from my parent class. In my child class, I have already overridden inside the business bank account class so that we can have our own debit functionality. But the trouble here is that, uh, let me just go through the code and let me highlight you. So this is the account balance that I'm having as a public by default, all these properties are public that we have seen already. So instead of this debit and everything, so 
we have applied few restriction to have the debit up to the minus thousand limit or whatever it could be but even though like i can directly access business account one dot account balance equals to minus five thousand so here is the output so even though we have applied some uh, extra functionality and we have written some extra uh, new overridden function here for the having a debit specialized for the business bank account, but still due to the direct access of this account balance outside of our class object, it is getting changed to anything as per the user choice. So it should not happen. So this is not a correct data privacy. So very first thing we should mark it compulsory as private. As soon as I'm doing it private, so I'll not be allowed to change it directly. But with this, one more new problem is introducing, that is, we are not even able to access that inside our normal debit operation. So if you just go to the business bank account class here, and the normal overridden debit function that we have written earlier, so there also we are not able to use this account balance because it's a private and coming from a parent class so this account balance we kept it as a private now so it will be only accessible within the bank account class and right now we are trying to access the account balance variable inside the newly written overridden debit function which is inside our business bank account of course it should be available ideally because it's an inheritance but due to the private modifier properties it will be only available within the class. So what could be the solution for this? We can't keep it even the public. If we keep it public, it is uh, directly available globally and we have seen what are the problems are coming with that. So there is a third access uh, specifier for this that is protected. So which will help us if you make this account balance as protected. So it will be also accessible inside your child class that is business bank account. So let's go to the code. And here, instead of private, make it protected. And with this, we are solving the problem and we are even able to access this account balance inside of our child class. And with this, we can also confirm that we are not even directly able to access it like a public, which was our initial problem. Let's also confirm that. So here you can see here, it is not even showing us to directly account access the account balance and we can't change it. Let's also confirm that yes, it's a protected. So we are solving this both problem. So here is the third access modifier that is protected. We have seen. Let's try to understand one interesting topic that is abstract classes. So what is abstract classes? Let's try to understand from our same bank scenario perspective. So here we are having the three different classes ready with us that we have already created well here these three classes. So now out of these three classes, can I create object of student bank account? Yes, we can and we have did. Can I create for business bank account object? Yes, I can create. Can I create an object of this bank account class? Yes, of course we can create here. But what the bank decided now, we are going to just have these two types of bank accounts and from now onwards, we'll just give the new bank accounts for the student bank account or the business bank account. We will not provide this normal bank account creation object from now onwards. So this is what the bank decided. But for now, if you just come up here and uh, if you just try to create the normal bank account by giving the three parameters which are necessary to it, you can create. You can create a student account by giving the next extra additional parameter that is their college name. So these are the possible. So now bank want to restrict the new bank account should not be get created from this class here. It should be only allowed from a student or a business one. So what we can do, the this particular class, we can mark as an abstract class. And when you mark a class as an abstract class, it means that you cannot create object out of it. You can just use it to inherit. And this is what we are doing in our case now. So to do that, you just need to apply a simply a uh, abstract keyword over here in front of it. Abstract. That's it. As soon as you're doing this, you can see if I'm just going to the line number 82 where I'm creating the normal bank account. 
so it is giving me an error here it's an abstract class and you cannot create an instance of it what is instance instance means an object you cannot create an object of it so here is the way the bank is restricting creation of the new object for the normal bank account and here is a practical example how the abstract classes will be useful in the next lecture we'll see the abstract methods and the abstract properties abstract method uh, what's the use of the abstract method very first thing so abstract method is a method where we are not defining its functionality we are just declaring it how ex exactly it should be but how exactly it should behave that we are not defining or declaring that we should be done in the child class so let's say in this particular case in the bank account anyway we have restricted this bank account directly cannot create any object we can only create an object out of the student bank account or the business bank account class so we are just taking the properties and the methods the basic functionality of a bank account from our parent to the business bank account here and we can create an object of business bank account then but let's say in this particular bank account class the parent class the bank introduce one more new regulation they are saying that if any bank account either the student bank account or the business bank account anyone you are inheriting from me as a normal bank account you should compulsory start implementing the net banking functionality in your own way for the respective class so it will define in this way so the bank account parent class will say the ba net banking is a functionality that i am saying you you must compulsory implement when you are inheriting me so whenever the inheritance will happen whenever the business bank account is inheriting the parent class bank account it must implement this abstract method called net banking so the business bank account will implement the net banking in your in their own way so that uh, their business uh, uh, bank account holders can use the net banking facility and again the student bank account is also doing an inheritance so it also must implement the net banking facility for the student in their own way inside the student bank account class so they also need to do that it's become a compulsion now because the bank account class is mentioning this as an abstract method so when you are mentioning it as an abstract method inside a parent class so you are putting a compulsion on all the child class which are below that to compulsory implement that if you are not doing that implementation you cannot create an object of student bank account also or the business bank account also because it's a most needed functionality uh, uh, with the abstract method we are saying it so let's try to implement it quickly so very first thing i'll create a net banking declaration as an abstract method inside my bank account so this is my abstract class called bank account and here i'll quickly try to implement an abstract method called net banking and here i don't need to give how exactly it will work i don't need to give its definition i just need to give its declaration and what will be the return type of this particular uh, method i'll just say void for now so i'm just saying that there must be a method whoever is implementing me so this is what line number 34 we have seen in the slide over here the net the uh, the net banking abstract method we have declared inside the bank account class now it's time to define the net banking method inside business bank account so let's go to the business bank account here so as soon as we are uh, coming here you might have observing some errors here so it is showing some error here let's try to understand that as well a non-abstract class business bank account doesn't implement all the abstract members of the bank account so it is saying that it is not implementing the abstract methods which are declared by its parent in the child here so let's quickly go to our business bank account and here try to implement so i'll mention here abstract method implementation so net banking facility is needed okay fine and i'll just console log net banking for business users 
that's it okay so in this way we have completed the abstract method implementation the definition inside our business bank account now if i go to this particular business bank account here my error is gone the same thing i also need to do inside the student bank account let's quickly do that so it's an abstract method implementation net banking Or student uses that's perfect now if I just come back here and see this is student this is business let's try to call student one dot net banking net banking for student users then business account holders dot net banking they are having their own implementation so in this way uh, the net banking implementation for the business and the for the student account holders both are different and they have implemented on their own way let's understand the abstract property abstract property is not widely used just to understand the concept what exactly it mean and how it work we'll just see an example over here so abstract property is similar to the abstract method we have seen as an abstract method inside the bank account it will just give a declaration that compulsory you should implement all uh, these functionalities inside the child class in the similar way abstract, uh, abstract property does and instead of method it is just applying on the property so in this case for example our parent class which is an abstract class the bank account it is introducing the fourth property the name of that property is branch that's property they are just declaring it inside a bank so the bank decided they are going to have a compulsory the branch must be mentioned for the student as well as the business bank account so whenever the accounts will get created for students or the business they also want to maintain the information inside which branch these accounts are getting created so they also want to give that parameter of the branch name but the implementation of this particular branch must happen at student bank account and the business bank account. It is their responsibility to implement it. In the bank account parent class, we are just providing a declaration that the all the child class must implement this property. So the business bank account must need to implement this property called branch and also need to initialize and everything. The responsibility of initialization, everything will be off business bank account here to handle this particular property in the same way student bank account also compulsory implement the branch property also take care of initialization and its maintenance so let's see practically how it's possible so i'm trying to just create a abstract property declaration inside my bank account initially so let's go to the bank account here and uh, just mention the abstract the branch and the data type i'll mention as a string here so this is an abstract declaration that we have seen in this slide let's go to the business bank account here and do the implementation for this abstract property called branch and very first thing as soon as i added this abstract here both of my classes started giving error because we we are missing the implementation for this abstract property in both the child classes so inside my business class here i'll mention the branch of string as soon as i'm doing this i'm uh, means the error got removed for the class but the new error is coming over here anyone can just guess what exactly this error i'll just pause for a minute so that you can think on it yes because we are uh, defining here but the declaration uh, the uh, initialization part is missing this is something like a normal class when you will create you have to inside or uh, add it inside a constructor and everything for the initialization right the similar way so the initialization for this is missing that's the reason we are getting this error so you can just go to the constructor part here and from the user we can also start expecting a new parameter here called branch in string and and as you are implementing this it is your responsibility of the child class to also initialize this 
you cannot pass it to the super class the parent one that's perfect we are done with the implementation inside the business bank account and now while creating the business bank account i can pass my last parameter that is branch i'm just giving here mobile that's perfect we are done with the implementation for the abstract property in the business bank account now i'll just give you a minute so that you can do the same inside the student bank account i'll just take a pause for a minute perfect so let's go to this student bank account class here and start implementing branch again the same error we have to compulsory include in our constructor and the initialization responsibility also we need to take care inside the student bank account class that's perfect let's come down here and here also start mentioning the branches let's say i or and for this the branch is mumbai yes we are done so we have performed our implementation for the abstract properties inside the student as well so here is the implementation hope it's very clear what exactly the abstract class mean abstract properties and the abstract methods let's understand the two specialized methods in the type script that is getters and the setters what's the use of this so we generally create the properties inside our class that we have done previously with few of the examples but when we are making it private we are having a couple of difficulties writing some special function to put the value into that again writing some function to get the value out of it for that particular variables so to deal with these scenarios to deal with the private properties inside of our class getters and setters are used let's create a quick example i'll not go in a much detailed example because we want to understand in detail getters and setters here so i'll just try to write a quick simple example here so a class called person i want to create i'll request don't go logically to understand this class like what's the practical use of this class because i'm trying to demonstrate you the technical part of getter and setter here uh, let's say i'm trying to define a private property called name okay so before this uh i'll just try to go with the normal scenario that we generally do so this is private and why we are getting this issue here because we haven't created the constructor so we don't want to go in details of constructor and everything anyhow the initialization initialization is necessary so by default value i'm giving here so i'm ready with my a quick class which is having a private variable called name of that person sounds perfect so let's p1 equals to a new object of person okay so we are creating object of person here that p1 if i try to console the p1 dot name here we can't do because it's a private one so if i want to access this name here or if i want to assign some value to this particular name what i need to do i need to write some custom functions to do that so let me just comment out this part so very first thing i'll create get name and uh, this is a public function i'm creating here which will return this name here so instead of direct name here i'll call my get name public method which will give the name which is right now in it let's try to also create one more method called set name so that we can set the value for this name and here we we will also ac accept some input so it's name equals to name that's perfect and here we can't assign something like that p1 dot name because we can't access the private property here so we need to say p1 dot set name okay so we are calling this method which is setting up a property private property and we are also getting it using a public method here 
So both set and get are working very perfectly. But we are writing some manual functions over here. So writing the function for each and every variable like this is doesn't make any sense because uh, and uh, even, even though if I want to set a value of a particular variable, calling a function, then passing a value, it is not making uh, a great sense here. So for these automation, there is something called getters and setters. So how it will work, I'll just comment out these functionality here so that you can compare it later. I'll also comment this one and let's create a new class here again with the name person. So now closely observe, I'm mentioning underscore name here and by default I'm giving a name. So very special thing here for this particular private uh, property, I'm mentioning underscore. It is not compulsory. This is just a general convention which indicates that if you are mentioning something like this, it's a private property and there are getters and setters available for this. Okay, so if I want to create a getter here, so I just need to write a getter. It is automatically giving me the property getter. If I just click here, it is giving me the exact specialized function for that, which is saying it's a public, it's a getter and the name of that particular function that I want to keep. So let's say I'm giving name here. And what I want to return underscore name. So why we are getting this issue? Any guesses? Yes. So we are missing this dot here. In the same way, if I want to set, uh, I, if I want to write a function, something like this set name. So there is something called as setter. So if I just write set here, so the property setter. So again, here I just need to write name. It is also taking some input parameter, which is of type string. That's perfect. And here I want to assign this underscore name equal to the parameter that we are receiving. So now you can compare both of these functions, both of these classes. Let me just remove this so that we can better compare. So this was our previous private property. This is now only the difference is there is an underscore here. After that, this is our uh, previously get name, which is just a normal function. This is our getter, which is a specialized function to get a private property out of a class and this is our normal set method and this is specialized setter from the TypeScript which is used to set a value. Let's see how this particular setter and get works. So let p1 equals to new. If I want to set some value so I can use it something like a normal property. I don't need to call this as a function. I just need to say dot name. And here I'll just mention. So we are accessing it something like a, a property itself. We are not calling it something like a function here and all. So this is what the benefit when you write the getters and setters and all the libraries which are you can find from the JavaScript, from the TypeScript, they use the getters and setters and at many places you can find this. And if I want to access this value again, what I can do, I can just say p p even dot name here. That's it. And previously, what you what we used to re, uh, write here, previously we used to say get name, something like this function we need to call. Now, as a property, we can use it. So this is a final representation. Let's see the output. Yes. So this is the way getter and setter works and simplify handling of a private property inside a class. You might be wondering about this is a first class that we are created in which there is no constructor. So till now all the examples we have seen how many classes we have created in each and every class compulsory there was a constructor and then we used to call it by giving some parameters over here something like this. But in this case we are calling the constructor here. We are creating an object here. We are also calling our constructor but we are not giving any parameter here. But where is that constructor here? There should be at least one constructor, then only this call can happen, right? So what could be the reason for this? I'll just take a pause for a minute. You can think on it, then we'll discuss in detail. Yes, so this is an invisible constructor that is being added by the TypeScript compiler itself when we are not adding it. So let's say it will do in this way, constructor, there is no parameter and it's not doing anything. 
and even though if i just run my application now it will run exactly the similar way the way it was previously running so it's an invisible constructor which is being added by the typescript automatically when you are not creating anyone and when you don't have any parameter in your constructor but let's say if you are giving some parameters like this let's say you are giving some name here like this so you have to define the constructor with one parameter because by default the empty constructor the this one can only constructor add can add uh, the typescript can add sorry so if you are giving some any manual parameters here you have to write here all the things that we have already seen and also write how exactly it will function and all these options so hope you understood how the uh, by default constructor is being added by the typescript let me just remove this so that you can understand it later so that's all we are done with this particular lecture in this module we are going to learn interfaces so what is exactly the interfaces interface is a syntactical contract between your classes and the interface or any particular object on which you are trying to implement this interface it just tried to put some compulsions on what are the things should get declared what are the things should get implemented so that your class or the implementing object will have a compulsory a set of fields ready with that we are also going to see extending interfaces we are also going to see how to implement multiple interfaces in a single uh, class we are also going to see the union examples with the properties of the interfaces we'll also see how to apply the read only properties on the interface and few of the examples of it and all together we'll learn how interfaces is beneficial to use in object oriented programming let's try to understand interface with an example here so we have earlier seen an example of a bank account which was a parent class then we have created two child class that is something called business uh, bank account and the student bank account and how the inheritance and everything will work with that so in a similar fashion we are also going to see the bank account interface so this will be our bank account and in this particular interface we are going to define the set of compulsory fields declaration that should be present and also set of functionalities should be present and this is called this is called as declaration here so we are saying that there is some interface called bank account in which there is a account number account name and account balance and along with that it also should have compulsorily two methods in that that is debit and the credit so here is a set of rules we are creating for uh, with the interface called bank account now any particular class if a bank want to create let's say student bank account so what a bank can do they can just implement this bank account interface into that particular class so at the time of creation of student bank account these set of rules they compulsory need to follow inside the student bank account let's see so they are creating a student bank account class so in this they need to compulsorily define these three properties what are those three properties the account number account name and account balance which which was a compulsion put from the interface called bank account along with that it also need to compulsorily define debit and credit functionality which is declared here in the interface so after completing this a object of a student bank account can be created on top of this if bank want to add few more additional things they can add into the student bank account class let's see for example they want to add a college name as a property here the fourth one they also want to introduce a third functionality here that is something called a student loan they can do that they are free to do that but minimum these things are compulsory they need to implement here when they are implementing a bank account interface so from now onwards if bank creating any new type of bank account let's say a business bank account farmer bank account or any bank account they just need to perform this implementation they need to compulsorily uh, uh, define these fields and on top of that they can do any additional fields so it will ensure if any new bank account that a bank is creating like a student farmer or anything it could be they are ensuring each and every class is compulsory having a debit and credit functionality and it also having these compulsory fields in that so this is how the interface will help to put a compulsion 
on the new all the classes that we are creating that they are following a certain convention let's say one of the new a rule that bank is putting up so what they can do they can just add that rule they can add that property they can add that function according to their new rule inside their interface so as soon as they do that compulsorily all these bank account it could be student bank account business bank account farmer bank bank account any classes which are implementing these bank account must immediately need to implement the new regulation and this is how the interface will help to create a more robust application with applying all these rules as per the business requirement. Time to create an example here that we have discussed in the last lecture. So here I'm going to create a new interface the way we have created the class similar way. It's an interface. The name of that will be bank account. Make sure the B is capital here. Okay, so this one I'm creating here and I want to put these three properties inside that the declaration. So it's an account number. Uh, just a quick note, it might look a repeated example that we're trying here for the same bank account every places, but I'm intentionally using that because you can easily relate an example and try more focus on the new concepts that we are introducing here. So the first one is account number which is of type number here then account name which is of type string and account balance which is of type number here so this is what an interface we have created as we have discussed it also have some other functionalities called debit and credit that we will do in the next lecture so for now we are ready with the interface let's try to create our class called student bank account so student i want to create a class called student sorry student bank account. okay so when i'm doing that compulsorily what i need to do i need to implement all these three properties which are defined over here so let's do that as soon as i'm doing here i'm getting few errors what could be the reason for that i'll just take a pause for a minute let's think on it yes we are missing the initialization here so i can just quickly add here the constructor or i can just give some dummy values here so better i'll just add a constructor here it's an account number of type number here then account name of type string then account balance of type number that's it and let's quickly perform the initialization yeah of course the sequence doesn't matter here just to follow the convention so that everything will be similar and we are missing here with this keyword okay that's it let's apply the pretty here yeah one important thing i would like to highlight here so let me just comment this particular constructor again so as soon as i'm implementing all the necessary three fields that is given by my interface here it is started giving me error so whenever you are getting an error please try to read out what exactly it's trying to say because here you are trying to implement a new concept so you should immediately able to understand this error we know already how to solve it this is a known one or this is uh, with respect to the new implementation whatever we are doing this is very important to understand so we have understood that and accordingly we have added a constructor so that we will not be confused with whatever the new concepts we are learning that's perfect so this is my constructor let me just collapse this okay so right now there is no connection between this class and this interface both are completely independent so here as a developer to be more responsible and i'm declare i'm following all these regulation that is given here but one of the developer might not follow these things at every or, or all these scenarios and that's the reason we need to implement this interface here implements 
bank account so what it is trying to say here the student bank account class implements the bank account this is what we have seen in the last slide so if any one of the rule if any one of the declaration that we are missing here to create a definition of that it will give you the error you are not performing the implementation in a correct way let's try to do it quickly so i'm just giving a something variable here called number so immediately it started complaining on student bank account let's say it, uh, what it is saying so it is saying that there is some variable called something is missing in the student bank account but it is required by the bank account interface so it is saying that this is compulsory but you are not defining it over here for your functionality so you are not following a rule to create a bank account class so this is the reason it will be helpful and if i'm not doing this implements bank accounts and everything so it's a developer mistake developer might forgot it or everything so let's remove this and keep it simple that's it we are done with this and let's try to create a quick uh, object for our student account we need a set of parameters let's quickly give it that's it yes and we have created successfully our student class so in the similar way for example we have created a student bank account so the bank wants to create one more uh, different type of bank account that's a business bank account so immediately they just need to follow these regulations inside that as well and they can start implementing so what they need to do so i'll do one thing i'll just take a pause for a minute and you can just quickly try this implementation just create one more bank uh, business bank account class and try to implement it and uh, have a similar class to the student bank account uh, which is present here i'll just take a pause for a minute let's try to do it together so this is a business bank account that's it we are done business account one business bank account one so this is i'm making it this few values i'm changing here nothing else that's it we are ready so we are ready of two different bank accounts student bank account and the business bank account which are following the regulations and everything given by the bank account interface here so this is how we implement an interface into a class in next lecture we'll see adding functions uh, compulsions of different functionalities by this particular interface so that the student bank account and the business bank account should compulsory perform few functionalities. Let's try to add the function definition, the function declaration inside our interface. So here we are already having two function declaration, two method declarations that is debit and the credit which is a part of our bank account interface. So we have already created a bank account here and we have declared these three compulsory properties here. Let's try to uh, uh, declare these two methods. So there should be some function with the name debit for which the input should be compulsorily a number and the output of this function should be void because we don't want to return anything out of this debit function it will just perform whatever the debit operation is there again we are not going to perform in much detail how the debit is going to happen here we are just trying to understand how the compulsion of a debit uh, function uh, declaration can be imposed on the student bank account so that student bank account will be compulsorily creating and defining the debit functionality in its class so when we are doing this as soon as possible as, as soon as we are doing that the student bank account is started complaining it is started complaining that the property debit is missing in the student bank account class but the bank account interface saying that it's a compulsory one so we have to define the debit functionality here as per the regulations given by bank account interface so let's try to do a debit it's a function as is given in the declaration there must be a one 
number input and it should return a void and there should be some definition for that and the for definition here i'll just uh, say something debit is happening in student class that's it or or just student object perfect so what is the new regulation was there for the debit the student class implemented that so it's all good and now the student class object also we can create and we can also call student one dot debit functionality and we can see oh uh, it's not allowing us okay fine we have to give some input yes the debit is happening in the student object the same way we have to also perform in the business account uh, uh, bank account here so let me just copy the debit function from here and put it inside the business account perfect now from business account also i can call the debit functionality okay so with this what we are trying to do we are putting some compulsion on the student bank account if you are saying that you are implementing me as a bank account you are compulsorily need to uh, define the debit functionality in the similar way we'll also do for the credit one credit it's perfect and here it's a credit Again, it's a credit and it's happening in the business object over here. Perfect. So we have declared this debit and credit inside our interface and we have implemented this debit and credit inside our student bank account and one more additional bank, uh, the class I have created that is business, which is not present in this slide here that's perfect so here we have completed the function declaration inside a bank account interface and the definition of that inside our student class let's give a quick look how the uh, typescript code is getting converted to the javascript when we are writing interfaces student class and we are implementing it and all these operations of course, it's not important to see what's happening in the JavaScript because that your TypeScript compiler will take care. But we are just looking into the JavaScript file that is converted from TypeScript after the compilation here, just to understand and improve our knowledge. What are the things supportable in the JavaScript and what are the things are not supportable in the JavaScript and how the compilation is helping us in more detail. Very first thing, we are having an interface here, then we are having a student class and all these. So the meaning of this interface is just we are applying some extra restriction some extra regulation on our class that is the meaning of an interface so if you open your javascript file and if you see this particular file very clearly it is having some options here which is almost uh, trying to represent a student bank account then it is also trying to represent a business bank account that's it there is no sign of the bank account that we have created so where is this particular bank account in our JavaScript? Of course, we are able to see the student bank account. Then we are able to see something like a constructor. This is not an exact constructor, we can say. There are the debit and credit functionalities and few more things in some different fashion, but they are there. But we are completely missing with this particular interface called bank account. What could be the reason for that? Just think on it. I'll give you a minute to think on it and then we'll see why it's missing here yes so we'll try to discuss this uh discuss this now so what is happening here the meaning of type uh, interface is just to put some extra validations or extra restriction when you're creating a new class and as we have seen initially this is something just for the developer uh validation so that developer won't miss any things that's the reason let's say for example even though if i'm not implementing this writing implements back account will everything will work 
yes everything will work because our developer written all the properties very correct written all the functionalities very correct which are required by the student bank account but if any developer can do some mistakes and something like this right yes they can do some mistake maybe they will forgot to write the debit functionality so in that case this particular student bank account class will not behave in a correct way so that's the reason putting some regulations putting some compulsions become compulsory so we are writing here implements bank account so when we are doing that compulsorily all the things which are given here in the interface must need to be implemented over here just for the developer's sake of understanding and for the compilation purpose there is no use of that apart from this and that's the reason inside our javascript file which is uh, the output file here you can see there is no sign of any interface again we are uh, doing the compilation uh, compilation against the es5 version of the javascript so if you just go to the ts file config so be very careful on this file i'm just changing it to es6 the next generation javascript and just saving it as soon as i'm saving this and if I go to my JavaScript file here, I can see I'm able to see the class or both the class and again the interface is missing here. Because in the JavaScript uh, latest E6 version, the next generation JavaScript, the classes are supportable, but there is no support for the interface. And of course, the interface is missing here. Just now we had a discussion on that why it's missing in the JavaScript file. So carefully again, get it back to the ES5 so that other things will, won't hamper. Let's see your JavaScript. Yes, it is something like previous one that we have seen and come back on your TS5. So hope you understood how the compilation is happening and how your interface is looking inside your JavaScript. Using union types inside our interface property, uh, Let's see how it will help us and uh, create our interface in a more good fashion that will be compatible for different types of bank accounts. So let's say the requirement here, uh, this is the bank account regulations that is given by the bank, which says that these three properties are compulsory and these two functions are compulsory. If any new type of bank account class you want to create, that sounds very perfect. So the account number is always in a type in a number. But some banks, uh, but some bank account types, like the, for example, for student, it's okay, it's a numeric. But for the business bank account, there is a requirement, like it cannot be a number. It can be a string or it should be a string for the business bank account accounts. So it is number and it is string for the business people. But here, when we are mentioning number, compulsorily, the student bank account should uh, consider it as a number and handle the things accordingly and business bank account should also consider it as a number and handle accordingly if the business bank account is directly changing this to string and started handling its operation accordingly let's say uh, they are also changing the constructor of account number to string and uh, also passing the argument here as a string and let's say they are giving b1001 so this is how the business uh, bank account want to operate its account number but here it is immediately showing an error that this particular account number is should not be a string it must be a number data type so what we can do here we can specify the account number can be of type number or it can be of type string so we can use the union type here to declare the account number with two different variations so either you can use a number or a string so in my student bank account i'm using it as a number and in my business bank account i'm using it like a string so there is no problem and there are zero errors in your application now so with this what we are achieving we are making this particular interface in a more accessible way so that different types of bank accounts can use different types of account numbers of string and number what's the difference between an interface and a class and when to use an interface and when to use a class so first let's distinguish both of these and then later we can decide when to use an interface and when to use a class so here in interface we have figured it out this is just a declaration you're just giving a set of rule book that need to be followed by the implementing class that's it there is no definition 
present there is no functionality present inside our interface it's just a rule book we can say that we are mentioning but if you just go to the class here the class can have both if you just compare this particular bank account class with this particular bank interface so this bank account class here contains some functionality called debit it consists consists of some definition again it is having the show balance definition how is the show balance is working how the credit is working how the debit is working it is also having few of the uh, properties they are also performing the initialization for that means actual operations are happening here along with that it can also give you some set of rule books that need to be implemented in its child class we have seen something called here the abstract net banking so this is one of the role that this class want to put on its implementing class so the class consists of both the declaration as well as definition the rules that need to be given to the child class for the implementation or it can also have some of the implementation in its uh, as well previously but in interface everything just rules will be there no working will be given so if you just want to create a rule book that need to be applied on a particular class so you should be going with an interface or, or when there is a requirement you have already some functionality that you can write already and some of the rules in that and then you want to create the inheritance and everything then you can go with the classes otherwise if you have just a simple working suppose something like this a class called student bank account you want to hold account number name balance and everything and you want to define few of the functionalities you can go ahead and create a class because you know how to create a debit functionality how to create a credit functionality how to initialize these variables properties and make use of it and later you can create the objects so here the class will be suitable so hope it's pretty clear when to use an interface and when to use a class let's see extending an interface into another interface so this is similar uh, similar to the class inheritance that we have already seen and uh, let's understand this with a scenario so we are having a set of rule book here that is called interface bank account that is being implemented by our student bank account and the business bank account so let's say the bank is creating a new rule book the version 2 of the rule book so every uh, uh, every rule which is mentioned here that is exactly similar on top of that the bank created some new rules so bank is saying i'm going to create a new rule book called bank account that's perfect and here i want to give the new rule here that is something like what we can say uh the compulsory it should have a not a helpline we can say let's give a name called v2 what the next functionality we can give it we have the debit we have the credit let's say we'll say net banking there must be a net banking functionality to the customers this is what the bank is saying in the uh, in the new v2 rule book but this particular v2 rule book should also consist of all these rules what we should do then copy and paste all of this here so instead of doing this why can't directly we inherit this interface into another interface here using extend that's it so inside the new rule book interface bank account version 2 we are having a set of rules that it should compulsory have these three properties and it should compulsory have these two and this is the third one these three functions as a declaration so let's go to this particular student bank account and uh, the student bank account is following the first rule book interface that is the bank account and let's say student bank account started following the second rule book called v2 as soon as we do that immediately the student bank account class started complaining what it is complaining it is saying that inside a new rule book called bank account v2 there is a method called net banking that you are missing to implement so you must give a net banking facility to the student class here so let's do that quickly net banking so there are no parameter and we are just saying your student net banking that's it 
Okay, as soon as we are doing that, it's super happy. Now you see the business bank account is not giving you any errors. Why? I'll just take a pause for a minute so that you can think on it. Yes, our business bank account is not giving any error because it's still following our first rule book that is interface bank account. As soon as you say you say that our business accounts also started following the new regulations called V2, then it will also complain you. But I'll keep it V1 for the sake of understanding for now. Implementing multiple interface. So what's the need of implementing multiple interface? What do I mean with that? Let's say we are already having an interface called bank account. We are implementing that inside business bank account. And this is what we have done. This is our interface. And this is our business bank account where we are implementing the bank account. But now the topic is there is a need to implement multiple uh, interfaces inside our business bank account. So what could be that? Uh, cost. So uh, with this particular interface implementation here, we are saying that we are following the business bank account class is following all the regulation that is needed for the bank account. So let's say the government introduced few more new regulations uh, for the banking standards. So that also need to be implemented here, right? So that time we also need to say comma and the new uh, interfaces. So as per the new government regulations, we also need to implement that here and the necessary changes inside the class we need to do. So that's the reason we need the multiple interface. So let's say there is a new interface with the name called bank standards, which is a new regulations given by government. And it is saying that uh, you must have a compulsory one property called ID proof for the customer for any business bank account. And you must also provide one new functionality to the, them, them that is helpline. So in this way, we are implementing two interface. One is the previous one, bank account, and the new one, bank standards, inside our business bank account. So when you are implementing the new interface, bank standards, into the business bank account class, so you need to implement all the functionality is given inside the new standards so you need to add id proof as a property you need to add helpline as a function as per the new guidelines given in the business standards interface so let's try to do this with a quick example so i'll create a new interface here called business so what's the name we have given bank standards okay standards and here we should have an id proof one field here I'll just mention as a string for now and uh, we should also have some mechanism for the line so it is just a uh, won't accept any particular parameter and it is just a void it's want to give a dummy functionality declaration here so the new bank standards are saying that you must have an ID proof and the helpline and it must need to be applied on a business bank account class. So when we want to do that, so you just need to apply one comma here and you need to say my business bank account class also started supporting the new regulations given inside the bank standards interface. As soon as you are doing that, the class is started complaining. You are missing with the two things. One is the ID proof and one more is the, it is, it is just showing you the ID proof for now. So let's say ID proof here. Okay. And I'm just initializing with this something called NA here. Just the sake of that initialization error won't come. But the important here is that we are completing the declaration part and implementation part for ID proof. If you just go here again, it is also showing you it must also have one helpline functionality let me just make your like business helpline and the errors are gone in this way we have implemented two interface inside a single class and our new class is following the two regulations one is bank account and new is the bank standards here one quick interesting the compiler related functionality i would like to tell you that just now i observed here uh, let me just go to the business bank account here and comment out the helpline 
and as well as also commit me the ID proof. So how many issues we are having here right now? We are having two issues. We need to implement ID proof as a property and we need to implement helpline as a function inside this business bank account. We are having two errors. If you just hover your cursor here on this particular class, what are the issues for this class? So it is just telling you there is only one problem that is ID proof. It is not telling you there is some problem, something called you also need to implement helpline. So why? I'll just give you a minute to think on it, how the compiler behavior is uh, working here. Yes, so the compiler, if uh, we are having a set of errors in our file, it will just detect the first error and it will just ignore all the remaining error. It will just stop the execution and compilation itself. As soon as the TypeScript compiler figured out any particular issue, it will just stop the compilation process and alert you there is some problem with this. So let's go here and add, uh, perform the implementation for ID proof. And now it will tell you the second problem. The second problem is helpline. Now go here. So in this way, we have also understood how the compilation is working when there are different errors. It is just showing us the first because the rest of the errors that compiler also don't know because the compilation won't happen complete after that error. Let's see a quick example how the interface can be used simply instead of the big object oriented complexity and everything. Because of course it's a TypeScript which is getting converted to the JavaScript. Uh, it is giving you the facility for the object oriented programming but it doesn't uh, uh, doesn't like uh, always uh, you should be using always the object oriented programming for all the simple simple requirement because that will again convert you something like a javascript uh, java and uh, c sharp where everything is object oriented so it's a typescript uh, where java uh, the object oriented principles are supportable but it's not always compulsory to use the object oriented principles let's see with the quick example here i'm creating an interface like an employee so I want to create this employee interface with there should be a name for the employee compulsorily. There should be the city for the employee compulsorily. Then uh, it should have some skills. This employee compulsory and which is of type string of array. So this is a simple interface I have created. So I didn't need to create a class and then extend it or whatever I should be. So it's an interface. It's a set of rule book. When you are saying it's an interface, it's a set of rule book that uh, if there is an employee, he must have a name, uh, city and the skills. So you can directly create an object, which is a uh, which is a great thing provided in the JavaScript. So let's say let employee one when it directly started creating an object. And before creating an object, it is specifying that I'm going to implement employee interface or I, I want to follow the type which is given inside the uh, interface employee. So here it becomes compulsory to define uh, to give the name, city and the skills inside this object because you are adding interface as a type here for this employee one object. And let's quickly try adding a name. Good, then city. Okay, and the skills here. Angular, then OJS. That's perfect. So we have created an object and we haven't created any particular big object oriented things here like classes and everything in Redis. We have just simply created a rule book with interface and we directly created an object. So now this object is saying that I'm following the data type called employee as an interface here. So compulsorily you can find the name, city and the skills in me. So all the employees now will be created who follows this type will compulsorily have these parameters. So this is how we can simply use the interface with direct object without any classes and everything. And this is what is used in many libraries when you need to call the REST APIs and everything. What is utility types? So utility types will help you to perform some common type manipulation, which may be required temporarily for some specific purpose. Let's try this with a quick example here. So we are having an employee interface here, which is saying that compulsorily you should having the name, city and the skills. Uh, 
that's perfect it means whenever i want to create an employee object i need to compulsory give all these options but let's say there is a requirement it not logically makes sense here but these things are available you might relate with any other example uh, i'm creating one more here called employee 2 when i'm saying employee 2 here so it's again compulsory to define all these three options right but let's say i don't have the city i don't have the skills and everything i just have the name here and i'm giving the name like this okay but immediately it started complaining me uh, you are just providing the name but it also require other options like city and skills so what i can do i can just immediately manipulate this type that i'm using so what i can say here i can say partial what exactly i'm trying to say here previously i said i'm going to use employee as a data type in which compulsorily these three things will be available now i'm saying i'm going to use the employee as my data type but partially so this partial is a utility type so what is happening here this partial due to this partial it is having three uh uh, uh three particular uh what we can say the properties here right so out of that any one we can use here it is not compulsory to have everything but what's the restriction here if i'm using something new here let's say for example uh company if i'm trying to use any new here called abc it will start complaining me it will not allow because what's the meaning of partial if there are three available out of that everything is optional you can use at least one two whatever your choice but you cannot introduce anything new because you are saying partial of employee so i can't anything use anything new i can also just go with city also like this and i can also go with one if i just go with zero will it be possible i'll just take a pause here let's think on it or just give a try yeah let's try it together yeah it's of course possible with because with partial utility type it is saying that all these three things are optional for you it's your choice either you want to implement or not that's it so let me just leave this with just name so that it will help you when i will download the code from the resources let me create the third one called employee 3 and this employee 3 is uh, uh, before creating employee 3 here let me just change our data type so these skills i made optional here now so these skills i made optional inside my employee data type that's perfect so let's create a quick copy out of it here employee 3 and the set of skills okay so this is a normal data type that employee it is following all the three things are given but here the skills are optional so let me just go up it the skills are completely optional here so i can also remove this very correct it will also run with two but if you want everything should be implemented every uh, property which is given in this particular interface either it is optional like this or the compulsory everything should be implemented over here if you want to do that what you can do you can remove this but that will also create problem with the main data type right you just want to do it temporarily so you can do the temporary data, uh, data type manipulation over here with the utility type called required okay as soon as you do this it should start giving you error what's the error so it's saying that you must implement skills because you are not only implementing the employee data type and all the uh, properties in that are required compulsory for you due to this utility type so when you just uncomment this it will just start working as normal and if you just go to the here the which is just following the employee and if you even do remove the skills it will work for you because it's an optional one but due to this particular utility utility type of required it become every property compulsory of this employee interface for you so this is how the utility types few more utility types we'll see in the next lecture let's start with a few more utility types how it works uh, let me just remove this optional parameter here so that the upcoming example will be more simple for us and comment out these 
okay so i want to create one more object here which is of type employee and uh, this time my requirement is i just want to omit a specific uh, properties over here that i don't want to implement over here i just want to omit some specific things so i can use omit utility type omit i want to omit some specific things from the employee and which are the properties i want to omit out of it i can just mention here so i want to omit the skills so skills are not required i want to remove the skills from employee the interface as a property for this particular employee one object so i just need to give me name and uh, city over here that's perfect and i'm able to successfully create a employee one object here okay if i try to give the skills here so i'm trying to give the skills here it is immediately started complaining skills is not allowed because you have omitted it from your employee data type okay along with this there is one more something called as uh let me just guess the name out of it yeah pick so if i want to specifically pick a few of the uh, uh few of the properties only so i can just say pick and let's say i just want compulsorily the name out of this particular uh, employee interface so in employee interface i'm having the three compulsory field that need to be implemented but i'm saying i just want to pick only one out of it that is name and with that i'm able to successfully uh, create my object and if i add anything uh, other than that it start giving me error and if i want to include uh, pick up multiple thing i can just add an uh, union operator here so city i also want to give as a city and as soon as i'm doing that it started complaining to complete this object uh, initialization with this data type whatever you have selected you have given the name you also need to give the city here so this is how the different utility types we can work there are many utility types given by the type script uh, that will help you to manipulate the data type for some certain purpose and temporarily interfaces versus type analysis so what's the difference between these two these two are almost similar but there are differences with respect to the object oriented programming and everything the type analysis more uh, like tends to the javascript related things and the interfaces from the object oriented principles and everything so of course it's better to use the interfaces always but also there are the type analysis which are supportable and uh, which almost work like an interfaces and many libraries also use that which are purely written previously in the javascript and later converted to the new version of the javascript so let's try to understand and here i'll request you not to perform any implementation for this particular lecture this is just to understand a differentiation because the the no, no, no coding exercise is necessary or i just want to say here so let me just create a quick interface here with employee so i'll just quickly create few things here so i'm saying it's an employee interface and there is a compulsory name is should be there let employee one give me a second employee one yeah that's it and i'm giving the name okay okay here's a perfect way that we have seen already we can also do this in this way the type employee should be equals to uh one thing i'm missing here yeah so this is the same name we are giving right so let's give version 2 okay so i'm creating one more type called employee version 2 and this is exactly similar to your interface or let's say just comment the interface here and give the similar name so not even this particular uh, uh, usage of the employee interface we are doing that is changing here it's al almost the same the even object is of type employee it doesn't matter it's a type allies or it's an interface here what exactly matter uh, what are the important or compulsory things out of it we need to implement here 
that's it so here is uh, like we can use alternatively uh, alternatively when uh, whenever uh, uh, the type alice is needed or the interface is needed one more good usage of the type alice where we can't use the interface let's say i'm creating a type here called employee id equals to number so uh, let emp id so generally we give a number employee id and say 101 so this is an employee id which is of type number so instead of this number i can use the type alice called employee id this we have also seen in the starting lectures but here i can't use the interface because interface is something like that when there is an object and everything that time it will be useful so type alice will also help you to work with the primitive types okay next we can also work on the extend kind of thing and everything so this is an employee uh, let's say employee a second version of the employee we are creating here in which the city is also a compulsory parameter and this is doing an extend sorry let me just convert this to an interface interface and here I want to extend employee one and here city is compulsory. That's perfect. Now, if I want to create employee object of this particular new version of the employee two, so two things I need to give one is the name, and second is the city. Okay, after this, uh, if I want to convert the same thing inside the type allies, how it will work. So we need to give here. So let me just comment out these things and let's see the equivalent code out of it. So copy. This is a type. Let's uncomment it. It will be an equal to symbol here. Okay, we are ready with the first one. Let's do for the V2 and inside the V2 there is something called as city. So these are exactly similar to the above. Now we just need to perform these extend. So how this extend will work? So what we need to do? I'll just give you a minute on this. You can just Google it out and let's see how you can do it. Then we'll do it together. So we just need to mention here employee and symbol. That's it. So the previous employee, uh, all the data or uh, all the properties and everything we have mentioned that and the new one. So the employee two is now started supporting two things. One is name and the city. So let's quickly copy this code and put it here. That's it. It will work. It means the extend inheritance will also work here very correctly okay so we can also use the uh, uh, interface and the type with the class also let's try to do with a quick example so we have something called interface here already let's copy it okay and let's say class what will give like employee uh, let's say just v2 for the sake of understanding for now implements the employee interface so we must compulsory declare it we should write a constructor and i'll not write a constructor here because we know that this is just an initialization problem here it's an na here that's it okay so now uh, we are performing an implement of interface so i'll just give you a minute to think on it how you can do the same thing for the type allies okay so to do the same thing with the type allies let's comment out this thing convert this into the type sorry it's type okay and then let's go to this class 
definition and here we go we do not even need to change anything that we are doing the implements here so here in implement it doesn't matter you are giving an interface or you are giving a type allies that's a new thing that we have learned now so we'll just see few more options with this type allies and everything in the next lecture you can also just explore these options, but not necessary to implement any code for it. Let's observe a strange behavior of the interface here with an example. And this might be a strange from an object oriented principles or maybe novel scripting. But uh, with this, uh, we can understand how the JavaScript is also uh, understanding the code and how it behaves when start combining the things and everything. So let's try to create a simple interface here. Just I'll just create with one property in that. So let's say just name I'm creating here and uh, that's it. And what I will do, I'll just copy the same thing, the same interface name here, and here I'm just mentioning the city. What should happen ideally? Ideally, it should give us error like other scripting, other programming, like it's a duplicate identifier. There is already some interface called employ, uh, employee, and you're creating one more. But what TypeScript will do? TypeScript will combine these together, and it will do in this way. So this is what happening in background for the TypeScript. So JavaScript, uh, like it try to make it more and more lightweight when we say, so these are all the options that happens in background when the execution happen and everything, which makes the JavaScript lightweight. So it's our responsibility to keep it as much as code good. And anyway, TypeScript will keep it, but it's our also responsibility to keep our code good. And uh, let's uh, also create a quick object here of employee here and try to give a name here so yes perfect and it's also starting complaining that it also missing with the city so let's also add the city here okay so that's perfect why it's complaining any guesses what could be the reason okay i'm missing the comma here so that's it we are done with this and let's try to come uh, uh like convert the same thing inside the type and let's see what happens uh this is just uh, a quick uh quick try i want to give you like it's a type and we should say equals to and again it's a type we should say equals to but it is started complaining immediately here like employees already defined and everything let's make it one it's good no because it's something like a variables and everything when we are creating a type here so it should be most a unique or unique identifier so using type analysis it's not possible but with your uh, interfaces it's possible let's start our new module called generics so as the name it suggests like it tries to make your functions classes and many more things a generic way so it makes your function and the class and other things generic with respect to the data types let's consider one of the example for the display function so we'll talk with respect to the function here which accepts a parameter that can be a string that can be a number that can be a boolean of or any other pre primitive type so uh, if we give different data types have different uh, calling of this particular function so we might need to write the different functions for this which will accept the different data types or maybe we need to use the union data type here or maybe we need to use the any data type from the type script but of course these have some certain limitations but from the object oriented perspective we have a specialized thing for it that is called as generic which will help you to create the classes functions and many more things with a common data type that you can decide while calling the appropriate functionality that can be your class that can be your function and many more in this module we are going to see how you can uh, keep your functions generic how you can keep your classes generic interfaces the difference between the any and the generics when to use the any keywords when to use the generics we're also going to compare with default values and many more exercises in this particular module so let's quickly begin this module called generics let's try to understand the generics here with a quick generic function 
So let's create a function here. The name of that is display. And uh, let's say it displays a particular string. And uh, it doesn't give you any output. So no need to mention any output data type here, a log and then value. So that's perfect. And here is a log and just say hi. Let's see the outcome. Yes, we are getting our output. Now, I would like to also mention, uh, I would also like to, sorry, we missed calling it. Let me confirm now. Okay. So, the same function, again, I want to call with a number here. So this is not supportable because it's only accepting a string. But if I also want to accept a number, I can do this, a union one, and this will work for me and everything is good. But there is a small problem with this here. What is that? Uh, let's say if I want to give anything new here, any new particular data type, in that case, I'll be having a problem here. So what I can do, I can make this particular function as a generic function. So we can mention here a data type called T and instead of this string and number, we are going to mention it a T here. So this particular T is indicating a data type for you, a runtime data type for you, which will be decided upon the calling function. So we are calling here, uh, calling this particular display function with a particular string here. So if you just hover your cursor here, let's see how the definition of this function is looking. So if you clearly see here, it is showing that it is accepting a number here because I'm hovering on the below one. Let's try to hover your cursor on the above one. So it is saying that it is accepting a particular string. So by default compiler, what it is trying to do, whenever we are passing a particular data type, it is considering this T with respect to that data type. Or we can also say like, uh, let's give another two, uh, two arguments to it. The first one is string and let's say second one is also string and uh, let's make it value one and value two. Let's console both of this sounds good let's come move this for now so here the first one i'm passing string second also i'm passing string here and i'm hovering I'm my cursor here so it is saying that the value one is string and the value two is also a string so this is what the generic and now if i make it one two three and here four five six it will also work very perfectly for me because it is dynamically taking the data types called number and number in the second case. Let's see the outcome. We should be able to see the four lines very well and we are able to see that. Now let's try to uh, make some quick arrangement over here. So here with hi, I'm trying to pass a number. So what will happen in this case? I'll just take a pause for a minute. You can also give it a quick try. What will happen if I'm passing a number over here? Sure. So let's try to do that. I'm giving a number called 45. So it is immediately started complaining. What it is complaining, let's try to understand the error. It is saying that the argument of type number is not assignable to the parameter of type string. That's perfect. So what's happening here? When you have mentioned T, it means that what is the first parameter you're passing here? That is a string. That's perfect. It means this T is considered as a string. And you're using again the T here in the second one as well. So the compuls compulsorily, your second parameter should also be a string. That is what the compiler understanding. Let's try to understand from a compiler perspective. So compiler coming here and it is saying that, okay, you want to use any one data type. That's perfect. And you want to use the same data type for both of these parameter. Okay, that's look perfect. I'll do that. And when you're calling this and you're giving the first parameter high, it's a string. Okay, so there the TypeScript compiler understood T means string. And when it is coming at this particular 45, there again it is identifying it as a number and trying to assign it over a value 2, which is a string here, 
which is which accepts a string here but you're passing a number so it is immediately starting complaining with a very clear message it is expected a string here let's try to do it in a quick different way and in this time i'll pass a 45 here so again it's not complaining for me at 45 because in this case again if you understand the first parameter is 45 it's a number it is being assigned and given as a parameter for the value one so this t become the type became the number here and the same number i am also want to use as a type here because both places we are using t t here so the second parameter must also be a number but if you are passing a string it will complain you immediately for that so this is the way the TypeScript compiler behaving and understanding the things in background. So let's make it as it is like before. I'll just leave this example in the resources section. So by mistake, if you miss anything, you can just download from here. And in the next lecture, we'll see the more variations with the generics and applying on, on the functions. A quick clarification will do on the generic data types we are using what should be the naming convention for that so we have seen we are using a naming convention here called a capital t we are just using a single letter but it is compulsory to do this and always write a t or maybe something only a single letter or it should be a capital no you can do anything you can write in a small letters as well and you can also write with a uh, like the multiple letters in that it's not something like that you can only use one letter for that so i can also change it to like this a type i just need to mention the same over here because we want to use this type here and it will work exactly in the similar way let's try to do it something other like for example you can also make it a b c here i'm making a a and a this will also work very correctly there is no problem with that along with this you can also mention any other data type of your choice let's say for example custom one custom one and the custom one and even though if you are making it c small letter there is no problem but to maintain a common convention here always the all the libraries and everything they use the generic with a just a single letter like this and if you just need to use one generic data type in one particular function maximum time it is used as a t with many libraries and that's the reason we are following the same convention here otherwise you can also follow any other convention but it's better to follow the community guidelines on this giving multiple types here so let's see how it works so we have seen this particular display function is dynamically uh, taking only one data type that is a string in this case we have given because we are just using it t here so we can also use in some different way we can also say like t and p so there are two data types we are defining here so the first one will be the t and second one will be the p here so it is not something like that the first one will be t and the second one will be the p it is of course like high is getting going here which is of type t and the hell is also going uh, to the value 2 which is also again type of t here so whichever the first uh, parameter is identified that is you know considered as t here and we are not using the p uh, uh, data type here so what i can do here i can also make it in this way so t and p so in this way we are utilizing the both one here and what problem will resolve with this if i just make it mention a number here it's acceptable because if you now closely observe just don't follow this syntax this is just saying that in this display function there are two generic types they are trying to use one is t second is p that's it so when you're passing a high so this t is becoming a string when you're passing 45 this p is becoming a number that's it after that let's say again uh i'm saying here a value of value 3 and i'm mentioning a t here so what parameter i should pass here uh, as a third parameter so that it will be a successful uh, a calling either the number or a string i'll just take a pause for a minute so that you can think on it what should i pass here a number or a string in this case yes of course a string because when we are saying that when we are passing high here so this t is considered as string and again you are using the t it means you have to pass a string here yes and if you pass a number here it will give you an error 
when it will be successful when you will give give a p here and we have seen how the detail uh, the compiler understand this sequence and everything previously written type of a function with generics so let's understand with an example here and the example is not make will not make that much sense because this is a very rare functionality i just want to show you how the written types we can make it generic dynamically when we are calling it so it's a function and the, simply the use of this function is to just take a parameter and again give it back so a value and i'm keeping it uh the normal not generic initially so that we can learn more simply so the written type of this function is a number so it is not doing anything just taking a parameter as a number and again giving back a number the same data type and here let me just create n1 here and let's say assign and i'm giving some value here so it will just give me the value back in n1 which is my a number or uh, number data type here sounds good and if i console here everything should work perfectly as we have time yes so my next case is i want to create a string here s1 and this time i want to keep it as a string and i want to assign a string here called okay so this string i want to assign in this case but my assign accepts only number so we have to convert it in a generic one so let's quickly do so give a type called t here instead of number what we will use a t and while returning also i would like to give the same value it means the same data type right so it's a t here and before doing this i'll just do one thing i'll just copy so that we can better compare it so instead of number i want to keep it generic and again instead of return number i want to keep it generic and this particular generic data types i need to infer my function here so that's very perfect so in this case it's we are passing a number so okay fine the number is an input the output of this particular function is also a number you're passing a string input input is also a string and the output of your function is also a string now if you see here the data type that we are using for the s1 is purely a string so even though your function assign is a generic one so your generic functionalities are limited only to this particular functionality on your limitation or your complexity of the generics are only limited to this functionality once i get a value here inside an s here i can just use it like a normal string i can make it dot length i can make it replace function i can use all the string related functionalities on that i don't need to bother about the generics and all because that for uh, uh, complexity we have already solved here so this is how like we are using a written type from a generic function and this is dynamically changing based upon the values we are giving let's also try to give a new one here let's say a boolean value this time i want to give it will also work in a similar fashion so it's a boolean here let's give it true it should work sorry i missed some syntax here assign and true that's perfect uh, so we have used all the primitive data types till now let's try to use an object data type in this uh yeah, now on this particular t here so this time i'll say object one let's say an employee one object and for which the data type i want to say the name should be a string and the city should also be a string here so this is what i want to do in this case now so let's make it simple i'll just make it id as number so that we can make it more faster that's perfect and here employee one equals to i want to create an object here so generally we are creating an object here right but we are using this function now here so let's call assign and keep the required object as a parameter so what object i want to give name i'll just keep the name here and the id 101 that's perfect so this particular assigned function is not only capable of expecting or accepting a 
uh, a primitive data type it is also expecting uh, uh, the uh, the object data type the more complex scenarios it, the, it 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 might also accept a class it might also accept an interface there are more scenarios that we'll see in the upcoming lectures but i just want to introduce you this one here it is expect uh, accepting a dynamically an object here which is very helpful and if you see very closely here uh, we can give any number of uh, uh, properties here as per our choice and this will be very useful when you are calling the third party rest apis in your application where the number of parameters the number of properties in an object varies based upon different providers so it will be very helpful in that case so hope you understood how the generic works and also its return type works in next lecture we'll see what are there uh, there are some issues we might face with the return types of a generic one let's try an interesting scenario with the return types of the generics so let me just remove these functionalities and uh, create a new function here called concat and in this particular concat i would like to take a value one as a string the value two as in a string and the return type is also a string for this i'll just say written value one plus value two sounds good so let's log it and call concat hi second hello so we should just get the both concatenation together hi and hello in our outcome okay let's try to make it in a generic way now so while making it generic here i'll just take a pause for a minute here so that you should able to convert it in generic and then later we'll see how there is a problem with the written type here okay so very first thing here i can pass any different data type so i first need a data type here that is called as t here so i'll say it is not a string it will be a t it is not a string it will be a t and also my return type is a t here but as soon as i'm doing that here it is trying to show me some error here what the plus operation is not allowed at t and t what could be the problem here let's try to understand it's a string we are passing here so the t is a string uh, so okay fine the t is become string so of course the second one will, will also be compulsory string and we are also passing a string here that's perfect and the return type is also a string so we can concatenate the two strings very well that we know so what could be the issue in this case i'll take a pause so think on it uh, we have seen the scenarios earlier i guess so you should be able to get the answer for this Sure. So the issue here is when we are trying to call the same functionality, let's say with uh, a more complex scenario, let's say true and true. What will happen in this case? So in this case, the true you're passing, so T is becoming a Boolean. So the second will also be a boolean and you're also passing a boolean that's very perfect and you're saying the return type is boolean till this point everything is fine for me for the second call but when it comes here what's happening here it is happening true plus true is it making any sense here no okay we can also pass some objects here directly we have said not only the primitive data types or we uh, so let me just make your name just a simple object i want to pass here which is of which is completely unrelated here i just want to give the two parameters so i'm giving my first parameter here i'm giving my second parameter here so of course this is an object type so no problem this t will become of uh, whatever the data type i'm using the object of name and the string that's okay no problem the return type is also no problem but how the compiler will make a plus operation on this so always whenever you're facing any issue like this in the generics don't only be stuck with passing one parameter here with one data type 
So whenever you're getting any issues like this, just immediately try understanding it. It's a T here. It's a generic one. We can pass anything, not only the primitive, we can pass in class, we can pass an interface, we can also pass many more things in that. So if you just explore those scenarios, you will get these issues and how to get rid of this particular issue here. So there is no solution for now. So what only I can do here, by, uh, if I would just want to uh, give the return type here, I need to remove this value to here, which will of course, will not completely satisfy the working functionality for concat because it should concat the value one and two, both the things together. But uh, this is a technical difficulty over here. generics and array. Let's combine both together and let's see how it works. So let's create a simple function here, which is called as display logs, and we can get a different number of logs in our input. So initially I'm just considering it as a normal function without generics so that we can understand it very well. So it's a logs and we just want to apply a for each because it's a array. So we can easily apply a for each on each and every log. I want to apply a console here to just log that. This is the simple function, which is logging the list of logs here. Let's call this functionality called display logs and let's say, and give as a array, or array of string, let's say app started, then taking a request, shutting down this is sample uh, logs i'm just trying to add here let me add one more so that that prettier will come down and we can see these things easily again starting okay fine so these are the logs list of uh i'm passing here to the display logs function and of course it's a array of string and it is just looping it and printing it on the screen let's see the outcome first yes it's working and again the same principle and the habit that you should follow whenever you're writing the code always write on which way you have the trust then keep it changing as per your understanding because initially you might have seen i didn't write it in a generic way okay so i'm like getting a list of st strings here for the logs but let's say i in the logs list instead of list of strings let's say just accept a list of numbers here of course it might not be a great scenario just to understand so i can make this as a generic one so let's say t and here instead of string i'll mention the t here that's it it will also work in an exact similar way and now I can also pass the numbers that we know already. Let's apply the pre here. Uh, something wrong here. Yeah. Okay. It should also work exactly the similar way. One, two, three, four. So now we are, we can use the generic types with arrays as well. So that's an overall intention to elaborate in this lecture. Let's understand the generics with classes. So how the generics will be beneficial inside a class here? So we define generally the properties inside our class and the methods inside the class. So what are the data types we'll use for these properties or maybe the inputs for your methods? or the return types of the methods which are present inside the class. So we can keep these all methods as a generic one. And that's the reason we are using here generics in the classes. So let's see a quick example here, how it will work. So uh, I have a requirement here. I need a class, something called a pair here. And in that pair, I just want to store a key and the value. And the dynamic requirement here, the key and value can be of any different type. Let's say, uh, Initially, let me create here a class and say pair. I'm just creating it in generic for uh, the normal way, the without generic, so that we can understand it very well. So the key can be of type string. The value can also be of type string. So again, why we are getting the errors here? Because of lack of initialization. So let's quickly do a initialization here. The key of string, the value of string. So both I'm considering as a string here.
that's perfect and here i i also want to get the key and get the value and uh, let me just keep it private here that not needed but just to make it more safe so that values won't change later get key the return type of my get key will be string because of course my key is of string type i'll say return key sounds good get value again the return type will be string and i want to return here the value so we are ready with a class called pair here which is helping us to hold a key and value with that as a properties and it also providing us two methods to uh, uh, to get to know what's a key and what's a value over here so let's quickly create an object out of it let pair one and new pair so let's say we are trying to store uh, create this p1 pair to just store the value uh like key and value pair something like that let's say name is a key and what's the name so this is the name after that again i want to create one more that is p2 so what's the id an id here generally this id should be mentioned with number right so i want to mention it as a number and here the trouble is coming so it's saying that it's not allowed because the uh, the value should be of string and the complete value or uh, data property is defined with the data type of string inside the whole working of this class so we need the dynamic types here that could be even for the key or maybe the value we'll just look for the value here the uh, the value can be string the value can be uh the number again one more pair i would like to create like uh, okay like uh, what we can say is manager so we can also say true and false so different type of data we are giving here but our class is not supportable because these data types are fixed here for the value it's a string so it's time to make it generic to have this functionality working so let's comment out this functionality so that no errors will come and uh, here in this particular constructor before the constructor here for this class i'll mention here i'm going to use a generic data type called t i just need one data type initially so that's the reason i've just mentioned t here so instead of this value string here what i'll mention here t again in the constructor also this will not be always string it will be of t generic type that will be decided uh, whenever it is getting called again here the get value function the return type of this is also not a string always and also it is started throwing some error so this will be also of type t it can be a boolean it can be a string it can be a number it can be anything that we are you uh, means at the time of calling it will be decided that's perfect here And if I try to create the object P2 and P3, it will very perfectly work. So the second parameter we are passing is 101 here. So when it's coming here to the value and understanding it's a T, so it is considering this T as a number and at all these places, it is making it number, again here a number and everything. So if even if I just call this get value and get sing and everything, the appropriate data type will be returned to us. So this is how we are using the uh, generics inside a class. I'll just take a quick pause here and I'll give you one small question or the small assignment. You also need to convert this particular key also to a generic one. So how you'll do that, I'll just take a pause. It's not necessary to do, but just a quick exercise. How also you can make this particular generic and uh, let's say you can make this also a numeric here. This also you can make is make it something like a boolean here like this okay fine so what we can do we can just make it a comma t so i'm just using two here a and t so instead of this string i'll just mention a here again a here here also a and it is going to work so now even though i am trying to use any other things here like say true 
and false it will perfectly work for me because both are completely dynamic now but of course it's not necessary i'll keep leave this example with only one generic data type we are using here that is only t because that will make sense in this particular pair class let us take a quick example with interfaces and generics so the same pair uh, class will try to convert to an interface here and interface pair so we need a key of string and a value of string here okay so we are done with the interface declaration let's try to create a even pair and uh, the data type we need to mention here it's a pair and it's going to follow the syntax of the pair interface so it's going to have a key in which the key will be name and the value will be like this and the second one the one more pair of data we want to create and this time i want to give an id here and the trouble comes here when i mention 101 because it's a number and it is accepting a string here so let's convert this interface into the generics so i'll mention here i need to use one generic data type called t here and instead of string i'm going to use t and here we go so as soon as i'm doing this i'm getting some errors at this particular place called line number 8 and 13 so i'll just take a pause you can just hover your cursor on that you can also write this code and try to understand what's an error and try to troubleshoot that Perfect. So let's hover your cursor here and see what it's saying. Generic type pair t requires one type argument. So when we are mentioning your p1 object is going to follow the syntax given in the interface called pair. So you must specify what is this data type that you're trying to use here. So I'll mention here, I need a string here because the value that I'm passing into the string. So I'll mention it as a string and here i'll mention it as a number because in this case i need a number here that should be treated for this t you might have observed a little bit difference mentioning this was not necessary with your class previously when we have done so of course for class also this will be done internally by the typescript so what we have written over there let's see the class right now it will give you a couple of errors because i don't have the pair class but i want to show you that syntax give me a second okay of course it will give me error here so please ignore this because we don't have the pair class right now present with us so this is my sorry this is my value and this is my key and in similar way we need one more that's an id and here 101 so here we are we, we are dynamically using two uh, data types as a generic one here in the previous example this is for string this is for number but we haven't passed here uh, that particular data type so what the typescript was doing in background automatically when the compilation is happening so it is adding that here like this automatically it's a string needed here and it's a number needed in the generic data type that we are using and the same is mentioning here so in types uh, with interfaces it's a compulsory like typescript won't add that but with uh, classes it will add that so let me just comment these two because there should not be any confusion and here is an example for interface with generics Let's understand one interesting uh, comparison here between the generics and the any keyword here. So what are the difficulties will come when we are using the any, how it is beneficial, the generic with, uh, with respect to the any keyword, because of course the generic will have the more uh, possibilities and we can have more advantages because it's from an object oriented perspective background. So let's try to create a quick example, both uh, combined together and try to figure out at what point we might face an issue. And one quick note here, the example might not sound well that much correct here, but to create the scenario to differentiate the generics and the any keyword, I'm just trying to write a sample uh, example here. So I'm trying to create a function here with the name assign and uh, I just simply want to take a value and uh, that is of string, string, the written type is also a string and it's simply returning a value here 
okay and uh, if i just create a normal s1 equals to and i say assign and if i just give some parameter here it will work in this way so that's it so now i want to convert this particular function as a generic function and let's try how uh, we can uh, give more inputs to that so assign with generic the name also i'm giving with uh, like that because we are going to have one more function which is not generic coming up so when it's a generic we also need to mention a generic data type here that we have seen al al already so the value is of type t instead of string as well as the written type is also of type t here okay good and now here instead of directly doing this uh, function calling and everything i just want to create two input first of all here so let's say numeric numeric string here which is of type string and i'm mentioning number 10 here and one more input i would like to keep it ready here that is a list of names and it's a string of array so i'm just trying to give the list of strings names here okay and now i would like to create my output so generic uh, numeric and i'm trying to call assign with generic here and uh, want to give a parameter called numeric string so what's happening here we are calling gen uh, assign with generic passing a numeric string here just a number 10 we are passing here this is not much uh like even though if you are not using it it will uh, it, there will be no problem if you are just writing it something like this but i need these inputs again in upcoming example here that i need to write below this that's the reason i'm just creating the variables out of it so let me just use the same one here okay it's working very much perfect fine one more time i'd like to call it and just mention like generic list of names here and let's give it a name this one and here i want to give the list of names here very perfect so simply we are just calling this assign with generic two times passing a string here and passing a list of names here and we are just getting the appropriate data if you just see the data type here it's a string it's a string of array because it's a generic one so these data types are assigned automatically or we are also we, we can also explicitly mention here for more our understanding okay so what i need to do there is some requirement in this particular code that we need to apply a parse int operation parse parse int here and i just want to convert this to an integer and want to display it on the screen so of course it's a string right a number 10 so let's see the output here yes we are getting the 10 the second one the generic list of names there also i want to apply the parse int operation so this is not possible logically because the data type here is string of array that is being assigned dynamically by our generic function as a written type so the string of array cannot be converted to an int so that's the reason we are getting a compile time error here so there is no need, even need to go for the execution part okay so this is how with the generic if there are any issues in the uh, the data type conversion and everything it will highlight you because with the generics it is being known after the calling what will be the data type of that particular variable or maybe whatever you're calling but it's not a case with the non generic any keyword so for now let's comment out the functionality on the line number 14 here and let's go to this function and try to make it a non-generic function let me apply a quick prettier assign with non-generic and here no need of these generic data types and all and instead of t what should i mention here any keyword okay so the data and type is also any because whatever you are giving an input the same we are returning so return is also any so if i if i come here and try to call the same functionalities copy and let's give the proper name to it generic numeric and i'll just trying to make it like non generic numeric string and 
the function I want to call assign with non-generic and I'm just giving a number 10 here which is already we have seen here we are giving a number 10 in return also it will give you the number 10 but here what will be the data type implicitly assigned by the compiler that is interesting to see so let's hover your cursor here if you very clearly see here it is giving you the implicit data type that is being returned by the assigned with non-generic is any here it's not a string even though you are passing a string here and again returning back a string here it will not give you a string data type it is giving you the any because that is what the any keyword is saying here that's a generic one not so, so generic one in times of the, uh, in terms of the data types i'm saying okay so let's call again for assign with non-generic and this time give the list of names here okay and let's also not explicitly mention the data type here non-generic list of names again observe here it is again giving you the names in the previous case it was very well clear that it was giving you the string of array so the data type was known to you what exactly your generic function is returning but here it is not known it's always saying any so what will be the complications with this so if i just console here and write the parse int operation and i want to just convert this particular non-numeric string which is generated by non-generic function here and let's see the output it will perfectly work because it's a number here it's a string number here but if i try with non-generic list of names here it will not give you any compile time error that's very important to understand here and here is what the mistakes we can do and the developers can do and the program can crash at the runtime and if i see my output i'll just get n a n not a number in javascript so these are the very critical and the complex issues that might not be identified initially at the beginner level but uh, when you keep writing the code that time you might experience these issues and that's the reason always it is preferred to use the generics over the any keyword or maybe the unknown or more kind of thing so in typescript just remember one thing always try to use the strict data type where any variable any function you are using the return type of that the arguments of that try maximum that the data type should be compulsory known it should not be any there so here is a, a difference we have seen with the generics and the any